Are there any other pecuniary interest, direct or indirect? Hear none, I will hand it over to the Director of Planning Services, Bruce McAllister. Thank you, Judy. Um, so to begin this session tonight, we'll start with uh, a few notes on the, the way the Moody meeting is gonna unfold from a process standpoint. So to begin with, uh, the, the process to be followed for each application will be as follows. Sorry, just getting a lot of feedback there. Are we okay now? It's, it's sorry, it's because IT is working with the mayor and he's in the same office as us, so we will try to keep it at a minimal. Okay, we'll start again. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. So with regard to the process tonight, uh, the process to be followed for each application will be as follows. Uh, number one, the clerk will announce each individual planning item. Number two, the clerk will advise if any written submissions have been received regarding a planning item. If so, the clerk will read the written submissions that have been received. And we have received written submissions on uh, several of the applications tonight. Um, for any items where a written submission is received, administration will then proceed with a, with a presentation on the file. Council then be asked if it has any questions of administration or the applicant if they are present. Council will then be asked what action it wishes to take with regard to each item. Um, with regard to notice, uh, any person or public body that files an appeal of a decision of council in respect of the proposed applications does not make a submission to the municipal clerk of the municipality before the proposal is approved. They are not entitled to appeal a decision to the local planning appeal tribunal. If otherwise eligible, unless in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to add a person or public body as a party to the appeal. And secondly, with regard to notice of passing decision, information on council's actions tonight will be posted on the municipal website on the planning services uh, uh, portion of the webpage. All persons who have made a request or who have made some sub submission regarding a particular planning item will receive a notice of council's decision, including the appeal procedures. Any other person who wishes to receive a notice of decision must submit a written request to the municipal clerk. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the clerk for the first application. Thank you, Bruce. 8A, applications for official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and site pool, site plan control, 1544951 Ontario Inc, care of Robert Paroli, 550 to 570 Park Ave West, community of Chatham City. Council, this evening we have received several uh, deputations that we would like to uh, read this evening. Uh, the clerk's office, myself, the deputy clerk Meredith, and the director of uh, corporate services will be reading these just to uh, because there are so many. So we will start with uh, Meredith. So the first letter is from Diane Dodman, uh, 585 Park Ave West. Uh, due to the recent global pandemic of COVID-19, I respectfully ask that you temporarily put this project on hold until such time as there is input from all concerned parties. This should not be allowed to proceed when the entire community is in lockdown from the virus for all non-essential business. There seems to be a rush to push this through. There is no need to rush in fairness to all parties. Some of my concerns that are against this development are, one, I do not do not need another apartment complex in this area as it is saturated with four other complexes in the immediate area. Two, issues dealing with aging infrastructure. Three, traffic, especially with 400 new homes being built down the street. Need impact study of all vehicles that use the road, which is causing traffic jams for school buses, trains that cause backups. This road is an emergency detour route for the 401 traffic, which will only add to congestion. The road design goes from four lanes to two. Do not need approximately 200 or more cars from this complex. Four, this is not in the city's master zoning plan. Five, not enough input issues dealing with the development. And six, crime. Since living on Park Ave since 1986, 
there's been a lot of changes. Some of them have been positive, some have not, since there's an increased vandalism, crime, suspicious activity with drug dealing, which brings many undesirables into the area and on my property. I do not need any coming from across the street. I can no longer enjoy my property on the east, west, and north sides of my house. This development takes away from the south side. The church had proposed to build single-story housing units for their senior members and members of the community, and now we are blindsided by a six-story apartment complex. Due to the loss of property values with increased traffic, increased noise, I submit to you that I am absolutely proposed to this development. Diane Dotman. Thank you. Next one is a letter from Tim McLean, 594 Park Ave West. Regarding proposed apartment building, Park Ave West Chatham, to mayor and council members, the proposed building site for two six-story apartment buildings abuts my property. There was a public meeting scheduled and canceled due to the lockdown of the country. The Canadian government has shut down parliament. People are quarantined. In regards to business as usual with council meetings has been extremely interrupted. There are too many concerns regarding the building of such a structure and many, many lives, property values, quality of lifestyles and surrounding neighbors want the ability to express their concerns in an online format is just logistically impossible to have 35 affected neighbors involved. This project I've learned is in excess of $100 million. This is a matter that requires the appropriate forum to have a rational discussion. It is my intention of this communication to wait, hit the pause on the meeting of this project. Allow us the opportunity to be informed. Mayor quoted Chatham News, March 20th, we've postponed anything with any controversy. We've got to make sure that we're not going behind closed doors to pass things. We want to ensure the public can see everything we're doing. Trevor Thompson quoted the same article. I do not want to go to council and approve a million dollar of gravel when we're dealing with COVID-19. This is a hundred million dollar project. I ask mayor and council to forego the meeting of this project until we have returned to normal life. I believe it to be the most criminally negligent to your con constituents if a belief of normalcy can be achieved Hello. with any online format. This is a huge bylaw amendment that deserves attention. This is not a relocation of a stop sign or the repainting of a crosswalk. Similar issues in council for sure. However, the size of this project needs talk. A response is desired. In addition to Tim McLean's um, submission, he has submitted three uh, texts from neighbors who wanted theirs to be submitted with his. From 549 Park Ave West, I'm not happy with the six floors, not sure how property value will hold up. Will property taxes go down? Traffic problems, Park Ave, a thoroughfare when 401 down. Don't really like 400 new neighbors, dogs, kids. Will this be a low income or geared to income housing? Driveway to buildings will cause exiting driveways across the road difficult. Suggestions for another site, Grand Ave, end of Taylor. The next one is from Mike Van Bemmel. I'm emailing you regarding a six-story apartment complex proposal on Park Ave in Chatham, Ontario. I'm against the six-story complex being built for a number of reasons. One, it will cause a lot of noise building this complex. I work afternoons and midnight shift. I sleep during the day, so this will most almost make it impossible to sleep. Two, my property will decrease in value substantially. Three, the crime rate will increase and the safety of our once safe neighborhood will go down a lot. Four, it will be a huge eyesore. I understand about development, but it will have a huge impact on our neighborhood. So uh, who is going to pay me for my losses that I will sustain? My home investment will go down in value substantially. No one wants to have a house right next to a six level apartment building. I am 100% against this proposed development. And the last one is from 163 Bristol Drive. Uh, my list of concerns regarding the apartment complex project on Park Ave, major decrease in property value, loss of privacy, public safety and livability, security, noise, traffic flow, sidewalks and parking sun blockage, dust and pollution. As residents of Bristol Drive, we support the construction of housing in character with our neighborhood. We advocate for new development that is sensitive in its designs and is compatible in scale and character with its surroundings, such as townhomes or semi-detached low-rise units. A six-story apartment complex is not well integrated 
and to scale with the, S with the estate of the adjacent community. The two new six-story apartment buildings would be taller than any other building in the area and would dominate over all structures for building block for blocks. With more creative, thoughtful planning, this area could be developed in a way that would complement this unique area of Chatham. Thanks again for all you do and let me know what we can do to help. Uh, next is Kathy. This next deputation is from Chris and Margaret Newby. Below is a summary of our specific concerns. I was asked to submit on behalf of our group of seven. Our concern summary, number one, we have noticed a spike in crime since two other social housing projects were built recently that are within three and 10 properties east from this proposed project. This is concerning. Number two, no high rise buildings exist here. Even the church is only two and a half to three stories tall. This is concerning for privacy. Number three, there has been unsightly activity happening in recent years. Why add more density to such a small good community? Number four, no study has been submitted on the effects on the sanitary sewer infrastructure of these two six-story buildings. Number five, no study has been submitted for effects of nearby school children's safety with hundreds more vehicles driving over the sideways. Number six, zoning from medium to high density changes to higher crime, infrastructure issues, police burden, changes our quality of our aging home owner values and quality of life. Number seven, we do not expect to be immune to crime, nor opposed to any properly thought out progress. We believe this is not. Number eight, we are concerned we were given a package but not educated adequately to submit yet more informed concerns. Number nine, we are concerned we have no sufficient means to participate in this virtual meeting, replacement of the March 24th meeting. Number 10, we wish to be informed of a deadline date for LAPT appeal if this specific application is passed by CK Council on April 27. Number 11, we wish to be informed of an alternate way to submit an appeal as we cannot do so in person due to COVID-19 restrictions. Number 12, when backing out of our driveways to head east, very often our community must first head west, then turn around in the church parking lot to then head east. Will there be a new traffic light for all of the vehicles coming in and out of two six-story apartment building parking lots? The Kyle Drive traffic lights are too far away to help in this matter. Chris and Margaret Newby. Our next deputation is from Jeremy and Lisa Clifford, 3 Hampton Court. We feel like our concerns aren't going to be heard and this is going to be pushed through. Maybe we will look for property out of Chatham-Kent, but who cares if a family making good money will move away? You're going to have 244 families push us out. Just to reiterate some of our concerns, the builder is proposing a 49-foot building. Setbacks don't account for that, especially us on Hampton's Court. No other building in the neighborhood has height close to the height of the proposal. Privacy. The builder's answer, trees and shrubs. They will still look down into our yard with a pool and a young daughter and her friends and our family. Would you want that for your family? The builder wants to put pools in and they have their privacy because we can't look down over the trees into their pool. Also on the call, they said that we will put the building towards Park Avenue so the South has privacy, but put the pools in the South so the North have privacy. But what about us in the Southwest? We are screwed. Property value. The builder says there is no proof to say that our property value will go down. We disagree. When the property value goes down, is the builder or the city going to write us a check for the difference? Parking. Not adequate for 244 families. More cars are going to park on Bristol that live or visit the apartments. Common sense, residents, concerns, no engineers, study needed. And we will keep calling and complaining when it happens. Please forward our concerns to all councillors, city planner and mayor. All respond to this email, acknowledge that they have received this. this. Is this going to be pushed through city council because a meeting can't take place because of COVID-19? Is a meeting going to take place online again? because I think our voices won't be heard in the same way. Jeremy and Lisa, 3 Hampton Court. The next letter is from 
Andy Shebley, 135 Bristol Drive. To Chatham Kent members of council, I am a neighbor along Bristol that is per, that is proposed highplex complex will be adjacent to. Please consider my concerns when voting to amend the bylaw, which would allow for the high-rise apartment complex on Park Ave West in Chatham. The proposal to alter the bylaw that exists for the zoning for the zone bound by Wedgwood, Kyle, Bristol, and Park Ave West from medium to high density would in fact double the existing apartment complex density in the area and increase the single family resident density by a factor of 6.2 times. Combined, the population density will increase by five times that which exists today. Therefore, this would look out of place as it does not keep with the population densities that exist to date. The proposed apartment complex is also too high and it invades the privacy of all the surrounding neighbors. Effectively, there would be a direct line of sight into each of our backyards. I do understand that the complex would offer more choice for singles and seniors in the area to live, especially seniors, since that seems to be increasing in the area attracted by affordable housing and services for those moving from Toronto area to retire. This can still be accomplished by the same design, only a few stories lower, which would fall within the existing density bylaw. Please consider the effects that this will have on surrounding neighborhood and the privacy invasion that this would entail. I ask this question, would you want this proposed high rise building in your backyard as presented? I would also like to attend the virtual meeting on April 27th. Please forward me the access instructions. And the last one, Kathy. Mike and Mary Sue Glazier, 167 Bristol Drive. As a resident near the application of building two six-story apartment buildings, number one, parking on Bristol Drive, this street at times when everyone is home barely has enough parking on the street. There are two pathways that connect to both sides of the church on Park Ave. Will there be enough parking for the tenants of the apartment when they plan to reduce from 1.4 to 1.25 per unit? Number two, is there going to be a fence separating the building from the green space? Number three, can the property building and parking be moved to moved closer to east by 10 feet as per discussion, as there are no residents on the east side, only the parking lot of the church? Number four, who is going to cut the lawn in the green space? Presently, some of the residents are cutting the grass behind the residents' homes. Number five, Park Ave is used as emergency detour, detour route for the 401 when an accident occurs. Will there be a crosswalk light or stop lights in the area of apartment buildings other than Kyle Street and Park Ave? Mike and Mary Sue Glazier, 167 Bristol Drive. Okay, Bruce, did you want to go to the presentation now? Yep, you should see it up on your screen. Yes, we do. Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you, Your Worship. I, and I also just wanted to acknowledge, I um, um, have the manager of planning, Ryan Jocks, on the line here tonight. Ryan's uh, um, gonna walk through the balance of the applications after this first one um, when we get through it. But I will now walk through a, a presentation on, on these applications and uh, will attempt to address the comments that have been received throughout my presentation as a, I walk through it. So first of all, the, uh, the, the subject property is located on the south side of Park Ave West between Kyle Drive South and Wedgwood here in Chatham. It's a fairly large site being six and a half acres in area and it's obviously undeveloped and has been for, um, for years. Um, the lands are designated medium density residential by the Chatham uh, secondary plan for the entire southwest quadrant. And they're also zoned medium density residential. So the purpose of these applications is to permit the development of a two six story residential apartment building. Um, each building is planned to contain 122 units, so a total of 244 units on the property. Um, the apartments are intended to be rented at market rates. They are not intended to be um, geared to income, social housing or affordable housing, as several have asked in the uh, in their comments. They are market rent apartments. They also have amenities such as indoor recreation facilities and each building is proposed to have a, a swimming pool as well. Um, according to the applicant, approximately 80% will be uh, fairly spacious one bedroom units and about 20% will be two bedroom units. 
So the land use plan for the entire Southwest Chatham was actually approved back in 1991. And it really started from Wedgwood Avenue and it runs between Park Avenue, Indian Creek West to the, to the south and all the way over to Howard Avenue, including the, uh, the, the subdivision um, at Bloomfield. Um, the, for years, this area has been, been slow to develop, um, you know, starting at Wedgwood, working along Tweedsmere, and obviously out uh, along Bloomfield in Bristol in this area. Um, but certainly development activity has increased over uh, uh, the past several years. I would say the last five, six years, things have really started to take off in this area. I can speak to that because I also live in this neighborhood, just uh, for the record. So um, residential uses planned in the area comprise of both low and medium density building types for the most part, but there are some uh, um, smaller apartments uh, in the area as well. Um, for this particular site, it has always been planned for medium density residential uses, which could include fourplexes, townhomes, or apartments. Um, however, the current zoning does limit it to um, uh, three stories, and it also caps the, uh, the density at uh, 30 units per acre. So, oops. So the request here then is to uh, change both the official plan and the zoning um, to allow for a six story structures and to also um, slightly raise the, uh, the, the density of the, uh, the site as well to 38 units per acre versus 30 units per acre. As far as the zoning is concerned, the amendment is to allow for uh, increased front, rear and side yard setbacks to provide a greater separation than what's currently uh, allowed for in the bylaw. So currently a three story structure can be built within 25 feet of all lot lines. I'll get into what's being proposed here later. Um, to de decrease the maximum lot coverage slightly, but to also provide uh, additional landscape open space since there's lots of room on this, uh, this property. Increase the density, obviously increase the height to accommodate six stories. Then to decrease the parking ratio slightly from 1.5 units, uh, 1.5 spaces to 1.25 spaces per unit. So also as part of this application is, a, is an, ap an application for site plan uh, approval, um, which consists obviously of two apartment dwellings, each having a ground floor area of approximately about 22 and a half thousand square feet, at least the, the building footprint and containing 122 dwelling units each. So like any application, we, we meet with applicants up front uh, as administration and we, we walk through the necessary upfront drawings, reports or studies that we might need um, to ensure that uh, we're meeting all necessary planning, engineering and building requirements. So in this case, a number of drawings, reports and studies were submitted at the time of the Planning Act applications. This included a traffic impact analysis, stormwater management plan, an archeological assessment, a landscaping plan, lighting plan, and a shadow study. Um, also a site servicing plan, looking at water, stormwater, and sanitary uh, servicing issues. Um, a noise and vibration report, basically because of the proximity of obviously the traffic on Park Avenue, but more importantly, the uh, CNV line just to the north. Obviously floor plans, building elevations, and finally a planning justification report. So when we receive these, we posted all these these documents online at on our uh, planning services web page. So normally, a notice of application in a public meeting is given about three weeks in advance of the council meeting. That's what's required under the Planning Act. Uh, however, in this case, we had everything ready, so we decided to uh, give everyone ample time to review the materials and provided notice of approximately well, it's more seven weeks in advance, actually. Um, the notice was initially sent out actually before the COVID emergency order was in place. Therefore, after the, uh, the emergency order came out, we sent out an additional notice with specific instructions on how to provide feedback because of the uh, various procedural changes. In addition to this, the, the developer was going to host their, their own open house. It's not required, but thought it would be a good idea to give people a chance to review um, the material and, and ask questions. And that was intended to be on March 24th. Unfortunately, that notice went out just again before the COVID order came into place. So 
you know, unfortunately that had to be canceled as well. So what we, we worked with the developer and they, they hosted a virtual open house, the best we could do on April 16th to answer questions and to walk through the presentation. So before that additional uh, material was mailed out to everybody or handed out it, um, in some cases um, with the information that we also had on our website. So people would have hard copies in case they didn't have access to, uh, um, to the web for some reason. So as part of the submission, the applicant has also provided a number of professional renderings to give a better perspective of what the finished project will look like. Um, in this case, the developer has, is, you know, it's experienced in, the, in building apartments. He's done a couple in Leamington. He's also just finishing one in Windsor that are similar to what's being proposed here. So um, as you can see, uh, here's a, a rendering from Park Avenue looking at the, the front of the uh, facades of the apartments. The next one is kind of a southeast view looking across the, the rear of the apartments. And the final one is, is, is looking from the west across the, uh, the side of the apartments. So we talk about density and land use. I do note that the current zone, as I mentioned before, does allow for three story buildings as of right. Um, along with the density marginally lower than what is proposed here. However, certainly the Planning Act does provide a process which allows applications to be made to amend official plans and zoning bylaws as you know, markets and demands change over time. As I mentioned, this, this first plan that was put on in the Southwest is almost 30 years old now. And we've seen a number of changes, not just in, in this case, um, as development proposals come forward. Um, Council just dealt with one recently uh, back in, I think it was December, to the south of uh, Tweedsmere Avenue. So generally speaking, uh, it's noted that the, the Chatham Can official plan and zoning does contemplate higher density development in the area bounded by Park Ave, Wedgwood, Bristol and Kyle. It's the area highlighted in blue here on the, on the drawing. Um, that said, this area contains approximately 193 existing dwelling units, both single detached and apartments which when proposed with the 244 units, falls well below what the policies initially contemplated for this area from a servicing and, and density standpoint in 1991 when it was originally drafted. Um, it actually spoke to approximately 900 dwelling units in this in the entire area back when the plan was originally drafted. So obviously conditions have changed, housing demands have changed. In addition, land use policies have also changed over this time, both at the provincial level and the municipal level. Um, certainly policies now strongly encourage providing a range of housing types, densities in, through infilling and intensification, which is the case here. Um, in addition to this, the new approved uh, community improvement plan also supports new apartments and provides financial, financial incentives to encourage this type of uh, housing that we're talking about here tonight. Therefore, in support of these policies and objectives, the, the proposal does implement a number of housing policies and merits consideration for, a, for an infill development for various reasons, including it's certainly within the urban area and appropriately suited for intensification, um, definitely within an existing residential area and consistent with the policies of the official plan. It, it's accommodated by existing water, sanitary and storm sewers. It's located on a major arterial road, which our policies do speak to for this type of development. Certainly Park Avenue being a four lane road is a major arterial road and can accommodate the additional traffic. Uh, this has been confirmed through a, a traffic impact study that was submitted by the applicant and reviewed by our um, engineering department. Um, I also note here that in addition to this, on the capital works program, the area of Park Avenue between Kyle Drive and Bloomfield has also been identified to be widened out to four lanes in an urban cross section, similar to what was done on Richmond and McNaughton Ave in the last few years, uh, over the next several years when uh, it's fully funded. So um, that's obviously a necessary infrastructure improvement that will take place um, a few years down the road. Um, certainly the, the the property is close to public transit and other amenities, parks, schools, commercial uses, et cetera. 
as you can see on the map, there's abundance of park space in the area. Um, Mud Creek, the Mud Creek Trail system, which is about four kilometers worth of uh, contiguous trail, Blythe Park, Don Mahone Park, which uh, have uh, kids play equipment in them. And then obviously the Kyle Drive soccer fields are all within less than a, a kilometer walk from uh, this proposed uh, site. In addition to this, as mentioned, there is a, an existing connection and a pathway that was left uh, along Bristol to connect this property in the future when development did take place. And there is another connection actually through the back of the St. Paul's uh, church parking lot that connects into Bristol and then subsequently through the existing trail walkway system on Mud Creek. Um, adequate parking is accommodated on site. I'll talk about that in a few minutes a little more. And the proposed development is compatible with the existing development in the surrounding area. So I just wanted to talk a little bit from a planning perspective in terms of, uh, um, in, in general, that higher density residential uses next to lower density, density residential uses are not considered incompatible land uses from a, from a planning perspective. Um, there are several existing examples, examples of this throughout Chatham of six-story apartments or greater in proximity to low density residential neighborhoods. Uh, most of these are actually located closer to low density residential than what's proposed here based on the setbacks that are that are here. Um, just as an example here, we have the uh, the six story building that's at the corner of Sandy Street, Orangewood and uh, Sandy or Orangewood and Oxley Drive, right next to low density residential. Um, Riverview Drive, uh, the towers there, some are 10 stories, some are six stories, uh, budding low density residential uses on Riverview Drive. In fact, in this case, uh, they're building new single detached dwellings uh, right across the road on Riverview as, as we speak. That was part of the uh, Sugar Beet subdivision approved last year. Um, to just to give you some perspective. Here's another one, this is Trillium Village, which you know is uh, the number of, of apartments there, abutting low residential, residential uses on Campus Parkway. Um, and then finally, another example is 50 Missioner Road, which is uh, just right behind the, the commercial plaza, but directly abuts low density, density residential uses on Missioner, Aberdeen Street and Vanier Drive. I'll speak to this one personally, because I happen to live in this apartment in the mid 90s from about for about three years as I when I first moved to Chatham out of school. So it definitely is uh, next to uh, it's about 25 feet from the rear yards of those on uh, on Vanier Drive. Um, part of the other issue here is most of these existing higher density residential developments in Chatham were built in the 70s and 80s. So the existing housing stock is certainly getting older. Um, therefore, the options for people looking for this type of housing is limited as there are no modern facilities available. In terms of the actual site plan that's been submitted with the uh, development, appreciate that's a little hard to see at the scale, but um, as mentioned, the, the property is a large site, which affords the opportunity to provide large setbacks from adjacent uses and to incorporate a significant amount of landscaped open space. Um, specifically, they're proposing increased side yard and rear yard setbacks of uh, over 27 meters or 88 feet and 29 meters or 95 feet respectively. So about four times what could be constructed today is if these were three-story units under the current zoning. In addition, the rear facing walls of the buildings contain stairwell windows and, and uh, only five bedroom windows. So there are no balconies facing towards Bristol. Um, the buildings are sited on the property in, in such a manner that they will not cause any major shadowing issues or block sky views for budding and or adjacent properties. Um, therefore, the buildings are proposed to be located to provide the largest buffer possible between the six story buildings and neighboring uses. As well, both hard and soft landscaping, trees, shrubs, fencing will be provided so as to ensure privacy to the extent possible for both tenants of the, the buildings uh, and the neighbors as well. Um, as I mentioned previously in those other examples, the setbacks provided here are actually greater than some of the existing examples I showed you earlier. In some cases, they are as close as 25 feet to adjacent low density residential uses. Um, there was a question asked at the open house about possibly shifting the buildings another 10 feet to the east, closer to the church. Um, this was 
reviewed and taken into consideration, but in the grand scheme of things, we don't believe another 10 feet will change things that much. Also, it, it does change things from, uh, from an engineering and redesign perspective. Uh, there'd be a lot of rework required to, to shift them. And everything's kind of lined up with the, um, the outlet with the storm sewer, which also runs through that, uh, under that existing walkway in the center of the property out to uh, the storm sewer on Bristol Ave. Parking, um, there's been a few comments about the, the proposed regulations of 1.25 spaces per dwelling unit um, versus the 1.5 that's that's required in the bylaw. Um, based on the 1.25, there would still be 305 spaces provided. If we went to the zoning bylaw requirement, we require 366 spaces. Um, before this proposal actually came forward, we were looking at our, our zoning bylaw, uh, we, as we do from time to time, um, and we previously previously reviewed this standard, and we'll be proposing a reduction to it at some point in the futures. Based on our review, we found the standard to be very high compared to best practice uh, um, for parking. Because what happens in the end, we just end up with extra costs to provide parking. We increase our surface, um, and we have unnecessary parking spaces that simply remain unused. Based on the targeted market for the apartment units here, it's, it's anticipated that most units will only require um, parking for a single car, and some may not even have cars. Um, as well, each unit shall be allotted one space as part of their rental agreement. Uh, the remaining 62 spaces, which is still quite a few spaces, obviously will be provided um, as, as overflow and, and visitor parking. Um, I also note that the other examples I spoke to earlier in, in Chatham, um, they're certainly not at a one to 1.5 ratio. In fact, most were built at a one to one ratio. No prior, most of them were built prior to even the previous zoning bylaw. I've not really seen any issues with, uh, you know, um, a shortage of parking in these areas. And oftentimes you'll see empty spaces in these facilities as well. <laughs> So to answer the question of will there be parking on Bristol, I certainly don't see there will be a need for overflow parking on Bristol to serve these apartment buildings. So just to speak quickly about servicing, um, as mentioned, a number of technical studies were submitted up front and reviewed. No infrastructure issues were identified, which would affect the development. As mentioned, this area has been planned for um, even higher density in the general area um, back in the day. Um, in addition, a stormwater uh, management plan will also be prepared. There is an existing stormwater outlet already in place um, that will uh, that feeds through the under the uh, pathway into the system on Bristol and ultimately out to the Mud Creek uh, stormwater system. All water, though, extra water is managed on site, and that will be done as part of the uh, the detailed design. You know, storage and parking lots. Um, there's obviously lots of uh, landscaped open space here, which will also uh, act as a you know stormwater retention as well. And finally, the applicants also prov provided a detailed landscaping plan. As you can see, there is an abundance of landscape open space being provided in addition to the strategic placement of trees and shrubs. This includes a row of emerald greens, or typically known as uh, cedar hedges, along the uh, southerly and, and westerly lot lines. They already exist along the, uh, the easterly line with the church. Um, and then also at the back of the church, people know that there's already well-established line of, of cedar hedge line there. Um, I appreciate that it will take some time, but over time, these trees will provide increased privacy as certainly is evidenced by the church property now, if you walk back there, you cannot see into the back of the Bristol properties or into the church property from, from Bristol now. Um, there's also a question I think about who would maintain is, you know, for the most part, this property has been farmed. Last year it was actually in corn, uh, maybe right along the rear lot lines, there's some grass area, but you know, once the property's developed, it would be maintained by, by the new owner of the property. So I just wanted to just quickly show that there was also a shadow study done as part of this, just to illustrate, you know, you often hear with these 
taller buildings or the impacts on on shading and shadowing on adjacent land uses. So this is a um, the study that was provided and this is done at the summer and winter solstice when the sun is you know obviously highest and lowest in the sky. And if you walk through this, there really is very minimal impact on any adjacent land uses. If you're looking at the summertime, you have some shadow um, to the to the west and the south sides of the buildings, but it doesn't infringe on properties. Obviously, barely any shadow during midday. A little more shadow at 5 p.m., but more facing easterly towards the church. And then finally, at 6:30 or late in the day, you get a bit of shadowing um, off to the uh, to the south. Winter solstice, um, certainly first thing in the morning, you will get some shadowing um, across the road uh, park, but that quickly uh, changes to minimal by mid morning, late morning. 3 p.m., same thing. And really the one property that will be impacted the most is the church itself um, during the mid afternoon and early winter. So with that, um, we're recommending that recommendations uh, one, two, and three outlined in the planning report for agenda item 8A be approved. With that, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to the mayor to see if there's any questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, questions. Uh, any councillors have questions to administration? Uh, Councillor Wright. Uh, pass, Mayor Cannon, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Bondi. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cannon. We've all heard from a number of the residents that they're not very happy with the process, that this is not being held in um, normal times in uh, live council chambers. And I, I understand that. It obviously does make a difference. Uh, we all We all know that. So, in fairness, um, it'll be a council decision. I'm going to move that we defer the recommendation until council resumes as normal in live council chambers when these folks can come and speak to us and we can see them. Again, I think it's just fair that we've heard from these people. Uh, this is a big development. Um, it's gonna impact obviously the entire neighborhood and Council really can go one way or the other, obviously. Um, but I think it's fair that council does make that decision because we have heard over and over again for about three weeks concerns about the process and that this is not following the proper process. So I think it's a quick vote. I don't think we really have to discuss this much other than just vote. Should we defer it or not defer it? And, um, and then the people have been heard and their voices have been listened to and council has made a decision on that. Thank you. Can I get a second to that motion? Uh, I'm not seeing anybody for a seconder. Uh, last call for a seconder for the motion. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on. Any other questions? Councillor Crew, followed by Councillor B. McGregor. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. I just, uh, just a couple questions related to some of the um, uh, feedback from the community. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm asking things that haven't been already covered. Um, uh, the the fence. The, uh, there was a question about the fence that. Um, and there's a walking path from Bristol Drive that connects the property. Is it is it meant to connect the two properties in the road? Just thank you, Your Worship, and Councillor Crew. Um, the path, if I could, uh, I'll bring this map up to show you the approximate location. There is an existing walkway right here. That mm -hmm. was. That was uh, explicitly put there to serve this property. So there was a walking connection um, okay. to, to, there's a sidewalk already there as well. Okay, um, now. 
Sorry, Bruce. No problem. Um, in terms of the fencing, the applicant, most of the adjacent properties uh, to the south and to the west already have existing board on board fencing. Um, however, the applicant has acknowledged that there's maybe one or two that could be fixed up or one that doesn't have it with the cedar. He, he will provide fencing. But the reality is, given that there's fencing, it makes more sense to then provide uh, um, trees rather than an additional board on board fence against an existing fence. <laughs> Okay, and the other question, someone asked about the appeal process. Um, how will they, uh, how will the people that have concerns and want to follow through on the appeal process, where would they get that information? So when we send out the notice of council's decision um, on this application, uh, assuming if council were to approve it, we'll send out the notice of decision within the next 15 days. So the notice of decision out certainly outlines what the appeal process is, how you go about it, and where you can find the, the applicable forms. Um, the reality is it's on the individual applicants to submit their own appeals. Um, we cannot advise or, or assist with that from, from that extent, but uh, we can certainly direct them to how to do that. Okay, thank you. And one other concern that uh, we heard over and over was um, they were concerned about crime coming from another low-income apartment building. This is not a low-income or geared-to-income property, correct? That's that's correct. And I explicitly didn't speak to the crime issue because I really can't say a whole lot about that. Frankly, I don't think it's a valid uh, argument in terms of supporting or denying this type of proposal. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. That's all I have. Councillor B. McGregor. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Um, I did want to uh, move the recommendations and then just had a couple of questions. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah. just, I need, a, I need to get a seconder for yeah. that. Uh, Councillor Pinsonal. I will second that, Your Worship. Okay, go ahead, Councillor B. McGregor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Yeah, we, we did see a lot of uh, uh, feedback from the community in the past couple of weeks, which I, I, I think does demonstrate that there is uh, opportunity through this process for that feedback. And, um, uh, you know, I, I agreed it's not optimal. We all wish we could be in council chambers, I, I imagine, and uh, to complete this process, but we, we really do have to do uh, the best with what we have. Um, and I think uh, Bruce did a great job reviewing some of those concerns that were highlighted in the deputations. There is one that I, I may have uh, I may have just missed. Um, There's a couple um, of the letters brought up concerns over exi existing infrastructure. Uh, I know there was a um, mention of the servicing plan, the stormwater management, um, but was there any concern over existing uh, sanitary sewer capacity? I think someone mentioned that in a letter. Uh, Bruce, if you can answer that one. Short answer, thank you, Your Worship, uh, is there are no concerns. I'm just pulling up the servicing plan again here. Um, that there is capacity in the systems, uh, water and sanitary are within Park Avenue. Again, see this sketch, there's a, a sanitary tie-in here with the, with the orange line. Water is the, uh, the blue line, and the rest of the green lines are all the storm internal storm connections. And as mentioned, the outlet is already exists in this pathway and feeds out to the Bristol Drive storm sewer. Okay, great. And beyond the, the widening of uh, Park Ave, uh, was there any other um, um, on-road traffic management or anything that uh, is anticipated that will be needed in the future because of the development? No, they, there wasn't. The warrants weren't enough to to uh, justify any further uh, widenings or replacements. Considering that Park Ave in this location is already at its maximum width with four lanes, it didn't yeah. justify any further turning lanes. Reality is, we're talking. I don't have it right in front of me, Councillor McGregor, but the actual ship generation is is not real significant when you consider. You know, you may have, you know. 200 additional vehicles here mm -hmm. that are not all going at the same time, right? So, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Councillor Sakachi, followed by Councillor Kirkwood White. 
Thank you for your worship. Uh, I had a lot of questions wrote down here, uh, Mr. McAllister, but uh, I got to commend you on the job that you did uh, um, speaking to a lot of the concerns in the deputation. I think that you did a remarkable job speaking about the, the parking and the traffic, the green spaces uh, and the uh, setbacks. One thing I wanted to touch base on, uh, Bruce, is, is um, the vacancy rate in, in Chatham. How desperately do you think that we need a housing uh, development like this. Um, I know that there's going to be a large uh, investment in our community, um, and I've actually took the opportunity to take a look online of uh, Mr. Crowley's uh, projects in in uh, Leamington, and they are very beautiful buildings. So I just wanted to see. I know this might be not be specifically your topic, but just the vacancy rate, like in Chatham, and how much something like this is is needed. Thank you, Your Worship, the Councillor Sakachi. Um, as you recall, we went through the community improvement plan. We identified that our vacancy rate has definitely been under 3%. 3% is kind of considered minimal healthy rate in, in a community. And we're, we've are we been hovering well below that rate. Um, I know I, I briefly mentioned in my, my presentation in terms of uh, the the options to are, very, are somewhat limited now in that there's not a lot of modern facilities in this community that of this type of uh, development, right? Most of the stock is, you know, 30, 40 years old. Um, I mentioned my own little personal story. When I first came to Chatham, I wasn't sure if I was gonna stay here professionally. So we we were able to find, uh, you know, a, a nice two bedroom apartment here until we decided what we wanted to do. I can tell you just anecdotally, I've talked to other young professionals that are struggling to find that type of, of housing product in this community. Um, um, so I, I leave you with that in terms of, uh, you know, something to consider. Thank you. And last question is, I know that, uh, you know, the Councillor Bondi's point, there has been some challenges, um, but uh, in your best, uh, you know, best response, you do feel though that, the, you know, we've received lots of responses that we've been able to hear a lot of the concerns. I think that you've addressed several of them in your, your, uh, your your your, your uh, project sorry in, in the slides here um but you, you feel that there was an ample amount of opportunity for people to present their concerns and um, and explore a healthy dialogue with with the concerns yes thank you your worship um we've certainly uh tried our best here i i, I would acknowledge it would be a lot easier if we could do it in the old-fashioned way we probably spent more time trying to to manage through this and, and try to connect with with people, whether it's myself or or, or Ryan or um, or even I must commend the uh, developer and David French, who's who's his agent, who's done above and beyond, um, sent out several mailings, um, you know, delivered hard copies of all all the information, hosted a and we tried to well, we did host a virtual open house. We had about 15 people attend in that format as well. Very appreciated for your responses and, and really appreciate the detailed uh, um, presentation you provided for us. Thank you. Councillor Kirkwood. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just want to, Anthony Sakachi uh, asked a number of the questions that I would have asked with regard to the need for housing locally. Uh, there were two councillors on the Public Information Centre call on April 16th. Um, I was on the call because I wanted to hear from the neighbors in the area about their concerns relative to this uh, housing development. But I have to say uh, that I believe that the planning department has done the best job that they could possibly do in uh, responding to all of the concerns. Um, this will likely not be a popular decision on the part of some of the folks that uh, will be impacted by this decision, but I believe it's the right decision to make. And uh, to Councillor Bondi's request to defer, I guess I would have had a question related to what impact this decision to, re to defer would have had on the developer, uh, as I understand that time is of the essence. And if somebody could respond to that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Your Worship. I would maybe ask, I know David French is on the line, or I hope he's still on the line. Um, I think it would be best coming from, from him to answer that question if the, the mayor is so willing. Yes, please. Hi there, David French speaking, Story Samways mm -hmm. Planning. Uh, through uh, the mayor to uh, Councillor Kirkwood-White, 
uh, effectively time is uh, very important uh, for the project. Uh, when the applications were made, the whole uh, atmosphere in the world was not what we are experiencing today. Um, but that being said, we do have an offer, uh, an agreement, or sorry, an agreement of offer and purchase um, with the with the church to purchase the property, and that agreement expires shortly. And uh, it's safe to say that uh, if council were to, to defer a decision tonight, that the uh, well, I can say clearly that the uh, that the uh, the project would be uh, would be shelved, would not go forward. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Okay, Council, I'll just remind you to please vote and then hit the submit button and we'll watch for when all votes are in. Judy, it's Councillor Harrigan. It seems I'm not able to click my vote. Okay, when um, when I close the vote, I will ask what you vote before um, we announce what all votes are, okay? Okay, thank you. In the meantime, I'll just keep clicking. Judy, it's uh, John right here too. Mine isn't working, thank you. Okay, Council, we're going to do a recorded vote for this one just to be sure. So I'm going to go alphabetically, and if you can advise me, yes or no. Um, so we will start with Councillor Oche. Yes. Councillor Bondi? No. Councillor Crew? Yes. Councillor Sakachi? Yes. Councillor Foss? Yes. Councillor Finn? Okay, Councillor Harrigan? Yes. Councillor Brock McGregor? Yes. Councillor Kirkwood White? Yes. Councillor C. McGregor? Yes. Councillor Latimer? Yes. Councillor Pinsano? Yes. Councillor McGrail? Yes. Councillor Thompson? Yes. Councillor Wright? Yes. Councillor Salmon? Oh, sorry, you had a conflict. I apologize. Uh, Councillor Hall? Yes. Thank you. And I understand Councillor Finn had uh, left the room. Uh, Councillor Finn, are you there? Okay, and Mayor Caniff? Yes. All votes are in. Motion passes 15 to 1. With one conflict and one absent. Okay, 8B, application for draft plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment. 122566288 Ontario Inc. Churchill Park Road, Community of Chatham City. I understand that Councillor Solman has a conflict for this application and we have received one um, submission from the public and I'll have Meredith read it now from Mr. Wibb. Uh, we have a deputation from Bill Webb. Um, in regards to the new subdivision plan for Kerr Ave to Warwick Ave Oak Street, questions for the meeting. How will elevation change from Oak Street to Churchill Park Road? Agreement that no construction vehicles are to be using Kerr Ave or Warwick during construction. Last two years of road construction left use of yard unusable. 
plan for major traffic increase. This route of opening up Kerr Ave and Warwick Ave will increase traffic flow as these roads will now bear all the traffic for the entire new subdivision and also one currently being built. No new construction until subdivision currently being built is finished. Why not keep roads from connecting and put new road in behind the homes on Kerr Ave and have it joined to Earl Park or Earl Drive Park? Can be lo can be relocated in the empty field behind the new subdivision being built now. Will traffic lights be put in at Kerr Ave and Kyle or Warwick and Kyle? As now everyone will pass through here instead of Riverview Drive, Kerr and Warwick will become major roadways. Biggest issues is construction vehicles not using Kerr and Warwick. I would like to listen in on the meeting for this subdivision on April 27th. Thank you, Bill Webb, 59 Kerr Ave. Uh, Mr. McAllister, can you give a presentation now, please? Or Mr. Jacques? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Uh, this is Ryan Jocks, Manager of Planning Services. Um, the municipality has received applications for draft plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment for this project. Uh, the subject property is located in a central area of Chatham, bound by Churchill Park Road, Earl Drive, and Oak Street, uh, bounded by the broader streets of Merritt, Riverview, and Kyle. This subdivision represents a continuation of a nearby subdivision referred to as Sugar Beet Phase 1, which uh, was largely constructed as far as roads and sewers over the last 18 months and is currently undergoing new home construction. All of the lots in phase one have been sold by the developer to other local builders. And at this time, the developer has submitted these applications in order to bring new lots online to the Chatham market to respond to demand. This particular project uh, is planned to contain lots for 42 new single detached dwellings, blocks for six townhouses totaling 18 new dwellings, and a multi-unit residential development site slated for future development and is not part of this application at this time. To implement the proposed subdivision, some zoning changes are requested on these lands. The lands are currently zoned residential low density fifth, which is the same zoning as what is in existence on Earl Drive and Randolph Crescent, just to the east of these subdivisions. So the majority of this site already permits single detached dwellings. The back part of this property closest to the CP rail line is already zoned medium density residential, which does permit higher density uses such as townhomes and apartments, et cetera. This slide represents a conceptual development plan of the project. Uh, at this point, I can uh, briefly summarize that uh, there'll be uh, four new streets constructed as part of this project. Uh, the main street would be an extension of Chur Churchill Park Road, south of Earl Drive, where it currently connects today. Churchill Park Road would terminate in a uh, cul-de-sac close to the CP rail line, at which point it would end near the future development site, as well as a stormwater management pond. Along Churchill Park Road, it would consist primarily of single detached dwellings with two townhome dwellings at the very south end. Two other existing streets in Chatham in this area are Kerr Avenue and Warwick Drive. It is proposed that both Kerr Avenue and Warwick Drive extend east from Oak Street where they currently terminate and connect to Churchill Park Road. As well, one other cul-de-sac is proposed southerly on these lands. I should note that the extensions of Kerr Avenue and Warwick Drive are planned to contain single detached homes. As part of the development application, the developer submitted a number of planning studies and technical reports to support the proposal. One of these studies was an infrastructure servicing review. Chatham Kent found all the infrastructure servicing design to be satisfactory and in line with municipal standards. 
All sanitary sewer flows would flow to the existing outlet where Churchill Park currently exists. All stormwater will be directed to a new stormwater management pond. There is a current stormwater management pond on this property in the location of the proposed Kerr Avenue. This stormwater management pond was constructed as a temporary measure to contain stormwater during the first phase of development. Chatham Pan ultimately does not support the pond in this location, therefore it required the developer to relocate the pond to a more suitable location, in this case uh, next to the railroad and not adjacent to any existing residential development. So the stormwater will, from the streets and uh, roadway, will flow to this pond and ultimately out to Merritt Avenue. The subdivision will contain new sidewalks, both sides of Kerr Ave and Warwick Drive, one side of Churchill Park Road, and a short stretch that doesn't exist on Earl Drive currently, as well a municipal pathway in the municipal park will be realigned to connect through to Kerr Avenue, where it currently uh, does not. Uh, currently, it connects to Churchill Park Road. However, this connection will be um, taken out in favor of the new location. Another element of the subdivision in line with Chatham Kent's development standards is Boulevard Trees. Uh, so it's obvious that there are uh, several dozen very mature Lombardi poplars that line the west and southerly lot lines. As a result of this development, it's likely that uh, the majority, if not all, of these Lombardi poplars could be removed uh, over the next couple of years as this development goes forward. As part of our new subdivision standards in Chatham-Kent, uh, the developer will be paying uh, a fee in lieu of new boulevard trees. And after housing development occurs, Chatham Kent would undertake to plant one new boulevard tree per lot, uh, totaling 60 new trees appropriate for the neighborhood and this area. The developer also submitted a traffic impact study as part of this application. The traffic impact study uh, concluded that the new traffic generated by this subdivision will be accommodated adequately by the existing local roads being Earl Drive, Churchill Park Road, Kerr Avenue, and Warwick Drive. Uh, there has been some concerns uh, raised um, from some of the neighbors as well um, as from staff through the review process. However, uh, this is regarding cut through traffic. Um, cut through traffic cannot be quantified at this time because these, these pathways do not exist and uh, vehicle behavior cannot be observed at this time to recommend any measures. However, it is expected that cut through traffic will not be excessive and that through the development of this subdivision and through monitoring of actual cut through traffic volumes, the municipality will have the opportunity in the future to in institute traffic control measures such as ad additional stop signs or realigned stop signs as well as traffic calming measures over time. However, it is not recommended at this time uh, that uh, additional measures uh, beyond the standard uh, approach would be applied at this time. There are a number of written submissions that are summarized in the planning report, uh, as well one letter submitted which was provided to Council prior to this presentation. I spoke to a number of things. I've made a couple of points here on this slide. Uh, first, regarding construction traffic, um, Ultimately, construction vehicles are not restricted on any of the surrounding local streets, being Kerr, Warwick, Earl, or Churchill Park. However, the developer will utilize Churchill Park Road where possible to minimize impacts. Uh, this is also the most convenient means of access to the site for the developer. And I'd also point out that um, the developer who is undertaking the construction, Mr. Henry Heineck, has uh, developed a number of subdivisions in the municipality and is has a track record um, of working with neighbors and utilizing uh, low impact routes where possible. And I, I fully expect the developer to be accommodating to, to the municipality and to resident requests over the course of the build out of this subdivision. Uh, with regard to an elevation change uh, between, um, you know, Kerr and Warwick Aves as they exist and up onto Churchill Park Drive and Earl, uh, these roads will have a elevation change uphill, uh, just as Churchill Park and Earl Drive do today. 
So some of those lands along the side of Oak Street uh, will be utilized to, to bring these grades uh, through the transition from where they currently are on Kerr up to the new elevation of the subdivision. As I've already touched on traffic, I'm not going to repeat uh, myself there. And uh, as I said earlier, all lots in the prior phase are sold to builders. So this application certainly is responding to continued market demand for residential lots in Chatham. With that, it is recommended that the draft plan of subdivision application and zoning bylaw amendment application uh, be approved subject to the conditions noted in the planning report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, any questions? Councillor Latimer followed by Councillor Crew. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, could you answer a couple of questions that uh, I've gotten through the community? Uh, you already spoke a bit about the traffic, so I'm hearing you say that uh, right now we can't really say whether or not we need stop signs or three-way or two-way uh, right now, but we'll look at that uh, if and when the the subdivision is or the, the development is there but I hear concerns with regard to traffic construction uh, traffic uh, use particularly on those roads could you uh, or those streets could you comment on that uh, the other is uh, you said there's going to be 60 new trees planted how many mature trees are being removed um, for those uh, 60 new trees and also I had a question uh, put to me about the anticipated depth of the permanent stormwater management pond and why that there wasn't a plan to fence it thank you Mayor Caniff uh, certainly can address those questions with regards to construction traffic um, there will be traffic and it will impact neighbors uh, whether it be on earl drive churchill park road kerr avenue or warwick drive the only way in and out of this this land is through existing low density res residential subdivisions um, you know as i said the developer will prioritize churchill park road and then routes through riverview Merritt, and kyle as appropriate this route is the most convenient for the developer and does impact the fewest amount of existing residents. There will be occasions uh, when Kerr and Warwick Avenues are, are being connected where there will also be construction traffic on, on Kerr and Warwick. Um, this, this simply can't be avoided. Um, but as I said, our department will be responsive into responding to the public and reaching out to the developer. You know, should the situation, uh, you know, diverge from, you know, the reasonable expectations. Uh, with regard to how many trees are being removed, I don't know exactly how many. I would say there are fewer than 60. However, these are, you know, 30-year-old uh, Lombardi populars. They're quite large um, and have had many years to grow along this area. Most of these trees are planted in areas that will be either streets or new housing or a stormwater management pond. So it is very unlikely that many of these trees, if any, will be will be able to be kept. Um, with regard to the boulevard trees being planted, Chatham Kent hasn't actually yet implemented this development standard uh, that it has uh, just councils just approved last summer. And preliminary consultations, I would expect that. Chatham can, uh, through using the funds from the developer, will retain a um, company suitable to obtain and plant trees. Uh, they'd likely be at least five to six feet high and a caliper width that would um, make these trees hardy enough to survive the first two years. Certainly, um, we would not want to be replanting trees, and I believe we'll be looking at a two-year warranty in general for trees that we're planting. So. They will take some time to grow, um, but they will be provide for a very nice streetscape uh, over time. With regards to the stormwater management pond, the pond will be about as deep as the pond that's there now. Um, I, I don't know, I would estimate that from grade to water surface would be about 10 feet or so. It's required to be this deep due to the depth of the inlet and outlet of the existing or proposed storm sewers. 
the fact that they're not fenced is a result of the slope and the ratio of the slope meeting an engineering standard that does not require a fence. It's also the municipal preference and best practice that these facilities not be fenced for future maintenance uh, reasons. Uh, the slope is four to one and a local example, um, council might be aware that there was a fence surrounding another stormwater management pond in the Bloomfield Heights subdivision at Bloomfield and Park. This fence was recently removed uh, by the municipality and the banks were, were leveled a little bit more to a four to one slope uh, to provide for ease of maintenance, uh, more aesthetically pleasing um, landscaping, uh, remove, removal of the overgrown uh, vines and trees that would grow inside the fence. And that's what will be proposed at this subdivision as well. Thank you, Mayor Ken, if that's all I have. Thank you, Ryan, uh, uh, for answering those questions and, and uh, particularly about the community safety concerns. Uh, with that, I'd like to move this recommendation. Okay, uh, Councillor Crew, will you second that? Not hearing from Councillor Crew. Could Councillor Kirkwood White second that? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm happy to do that. Thank you, uh, oh. Your Worship. <laughs> so we got a battle now for. A... Oh yeah, I did. I thought you heard me. <laughs> okay, well we'll stick with Councillor Crew then to the seconder. And the, did you have any, uh, Councillor Adamer? Did you have any other questions before we proceed on to Councillor Crew? No, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Crew, any questions? Um, not really question. Uh, I guess, um, Ryan, are these properties all sold? Is that what I heard you say? Thank you, Mary Kenneth. Um, the first phase of the subdivision uh, has been sold and the, this current phase, I believe there, there are interests from, from interested uh, builders, uh, under the planning act, a purchase offer can't formally be entered into until draft approval is given, which is being requested tonight. So I would expect that that sales would happen, um, you know, going forward from this point if the applications are approved. Um, uh, one more um, question, I guess, or comment. Uh, they're all they all appear to be single um, single dwellings. Would that would um, age friendly be considered? age friendly units um again i just i don't know exactly what you mean by age friendly however the um i know some of the builders in the area are looking at um, a, a smaller uh, footprint that are more accessible um, slab on grade um, homes without basements for one so with all living quarters on the main floor and, and single story. Uh, that's in a prior phase of this development uh, proposed by another builder who hasn't, hasn't yet commenced construction. I have not had any direct uh, communications with any builders or the developer with regards to the exact housing types that would be constructed on these lands. So unfortunately, I don't believe I can provide you a better answer than that at this time. Okay, that's fine. But we, I guess since you don't know what age friendly is, we have some more work to do in that area. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Kirkwood White, did you have any questions? All covered. Thank you, Mo. Okay, seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Judy, it's Melissa again. I cannot click on my vote. Okay, we're thinking it's your just your connection. It just might not be strong enough to do the uh, vote. So we will gather all the other ones and I'll come back to you for yours. Thank you. Same with mine, Judy, it's John again. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Harrigan, how do you vote? Yes. And Councillor Wright? 
Yes. Thank you. Then all votes are in and motion passes 17 to zero. We had one conflict. Thank you. 8C, application for official plan amendment, OPA 59 and zoning bylaw amendment, Ridge Chatham Holdings LP and Ridge Chatham Holdings GP Inc. 20111 and 20262 Erio Road. And I just wanted to confirm, uh, Councillor Wright, you have a conflict for this one? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And we have not received any um, deputations for this item. I'll pass it to you, Mayor Caniff. Sorry, I was going to, uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much. I, I would like to move the council defer the open session planning until the June 15th council planning meeting so that council and the public are aware of the full benefits being provided to the community as a result of this expansion and that no further public notice be required. Okay, can I get a seconder? Councillor Finn? Happy to second that. Okay, any questions regarding this motion? Seeing none, we'll put it to vote. Councillor Harrigan, were you able to vote? No, but I do vote yes. Okay, thank you. Then all votes are in and motion passes 17 to zero. Uh, we have 8D, application for consent and zoning bylaw amendment. Linda Jean Erickson and Brett Gartner, 13746 Jane Road, Community of Camden, East Kent. Uh, we have one deputation that was received. This is the one that was brought forward from the last meeting and it's the same deputation. I will quickly read it, it's very short. I, Alan McLeod of 13735 Jane Road, Thamesville, Ontario, oppose 100% of the combined application for this zoning bylaw amendment. The reason, one, if the use of the greenhouse is a cannabis grow up, there will be ab um, obnoxious odors in the neighborhood and two, the light pol pollution. That's all I have, uh, Mayor Canna. Uh, uh, is there a presentation? Mr. Jocks? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. I, I can make a, a brief presentation as there was a deputation received. Um, the nature of this application generally is to sever and convey approximately 9,000 square feet of land from an abutting lot to the subject property. Uh, both of these lots are owned by uh, relations, family members. Um, there is a zoning bylaw amendment proposed as well. Um, first, it's to rationalize the zoning of the severed lands with the receiving lot. It does a number of things. Here, it permits the keeping of two horses. It will recognize an existing carpenter's shop as a home occupation. This is a legal use and business at this location as it was established lawfully under the Township of Camden zoning bylaw a number of years ago. It would permit a nursery as a home occupation and to be operated out of an accessory building on the property, such as a small greenhouse. And it would permit accessory buildings in the front yard, uh, but no closer than nine meters to the front lot line and no greater than 275 square meters in area. Based on the analysis in the planning report, it is recommended that the severance and zoning bylaw applications be approved subject to the conditions noted. Thank you. Councillor Pinsonal. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, after reading uh, Mr. McLeod's letter, I went and spoke to the, the property owner here and um, he has no intentions of growing cannabis in this greenhouse. Uh, it is more of a, a nursery type operation on a small scale. I guess with the federal uh, uh, laws out there in place today, any property owner can grow cannabis on their property up to a, to a certain number. So honestly, that could be done anyway, anyways, anywhere on the property. Um, well out there, I, I did look at both properties and the appearance of these properties are, are, are immaculate. I can't, you know, I can't imagine that they're going to do anything that's going to be detrimental to the, uh, to the neighborhood. 
I have full confidence that, uh, that, you know, j just looking at the things that this guy has done, he has another property uptown, which was kind of a rundown spot and he's made it into a, to a very nice location. I honestly don't believe he's going to do anything detrimental to the, to the community out there. And, uh, I will move the recommendation to worship. Can I, uh, can I get a seconder, Councillor Wright? Thank you, Mayor Tanif. I'll second that. Is there any other questions? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. Councillor Wright, Judy, and I, I'm a yes, mine's not working. Okay, great. Um, we will add that one in and all votes are in and motion passes 18 to zero. Oh, sorry, Councillor Harrigan, I apologize. She voted, so that's I, good. I voted. Yep, great, thank you. Okay, 8E, application for consent, Solus Farms, Inc., 65 Mill Street West, Community of Tilbury, West Kent. We have received two deputations on this one. And uh, Kathy, if you could read the first one, please. The first deputation is by Randy Hope. It reads as this, I am writing to express views and history regarding this property, which is approximately 30 acres in size at 65 Mill Street in Tilbury. This is not only about severing two parcels of land from this large plot, but also you should look at a number of other factors that were considered and supported back in 2005 and 2006 when a development was considered but did not proceed because of the crash of the economy that followed, which pre prevented it from moving forward. As proposed by the potential developer, wanting to sever off 1.46 acres of land to the south against the land that was set aside years ago for a municipal roadway to be put in to serve both the 30 acres and the property behind the car dealership. Since the land has been set aside, a lot of activity has happened with a car dealership establishing in the area and AutoLive, which is now one of the largest employers in Tilbury. When the municipality was working on this development, in 2005 and 6, it was recognized that the roadway land did not line up with AutoLive Road, which would create a huge traffic mess both on the south side of Mill Street lands, dealerships, residents, AutoLive, and the north side lands, the dealerships, for both people entering and leaving the property. In the proposal before you, creates that same mess, vehicles leaving from the property behind the car dealerships, the future development on the 30 acres all heading to Mill Street along with the laneways to, to the car dealerships on both the south and north side, plus adding as proposed a gas station and fast food, along with AutoLive employees leaving and going, creating a huge mess in the area of trying to get in and out of the properties. This is why the road needs to be lined up with each other to make it easy for all involved and maybe even adding traffic lights at this intersection. The municipality should enter negotiations now and as a condition of approval. Planning is about understanding the larger picture and vision. Even with the suggestion put forward in 2005 and 6 of moving the roadway over will still allow the potential purchaser, as they only have a conditional offer on the land, the same frontage and acreage as they are requesting in this application. Zero impact. Is the roadway just doing just going to be a dead end street if you accept the applications as presented or design for the future. Note, remember when accidents happen on 401 and traffic is detoured through the town, the pressure that is put directly on Mill Street. Further, what are the bigger plans for this land? Unfortunately, very vague. There are a series of, of photos that are contained within inside of this deputation and so these next comments pertain to that. Below is the layout for the roadway alignment should have which it still gives the developer some frontage but solves congestion and grows for the future. The future growth of Tilbury. As the community of Tilbury continues to grow, it will need more land for residential and industrial. Where will that be? As people and trucks move from north to south of the community, will the only way be through Queen Street? 
During talks back in 2005 and 6, the alignment of Auto Live Road and the new development would be the beginning of the West Side Bypass from Mill Street to Middle Line, 98 Highway, for Tilbury, and the line between Tilbury boundaries to Tremblay Creek, which is currently in Lakeshore, would begin to be negotiated to put into Tilbury's boundaries, setting the way for new residential and industrial lands, keeping in mind that all the surface water of Tilbury is gravity flow and it goes to Tremblay Creek. It's here that there are a couple of photos referenced in the deputation, essentially talking about possible road systems. And it's a discussion about expanding the town boundaries to Tremblay Creek and north from rail line to middle line in 98 Highway. I could go on at length about how critical the road alignment is now to this project and neighboring property owners and the larger vision for the community. But because of this new procedure during COVID-19, it doesn't allow open and transparent government where residents and business cannot speak directly to a room of elected officials and look each one of you and for you to see the passion of the speaker and to ask questions so that you make an informed decision. I would take any questions from council that they may have, but not possible. You should know, which I believe you do, that construction is at a halt. Only those covered by the emergency order can proceed. In conclusion, I ask that council defer the application back to administration with direction to align the roadways before approval is given. And I understand council has a copy of the photos that were referenced in the deputation. That's it. Thank you, Kathy. I have received uh, one that I have emailed to council right before the uh, meeting. This is from Victor of IBI Group and uh, acting on behalf um, of the applicant, I believe. Mayor, members of council and municipal staff, additional comments for application B17-20 and B18-20, Solus Farms, Inc., 65 Mill Street West, Tilbury. On behalf of our clients, we want to provide additional comments to our initial submission with respect to the above noted application being considered tonight, April 27, 2020. Our, addish, our additional are in response to the municipal staff report and the email from Mr. Randy Hope dated April 25, 2020. Municipal staff report, we have reviewed the staff report and we believe staff have considered all matters. We support the recommendation for approval and have no objections to the proposed conditions as outlined. We respectfully request that council approve the report recommendations slash conditions as provided. Mr. Randy Hope email dated April 25th, 2020. We were provided a copy of the email provided to the municipality dated April 25th, 2020 and provide the following comments for consideration. The email outlines a past history and a reliance that in our opinion is not relevant to the proposed application under consideration. The previous application was in 20 2005 and 2006, which is 14 to 15 years ago, considered by a different council and a different form and greater intensity of development. We believe that the council should consider what application is before them today and not one from the past. Two, the previous proposed development was for a totally different land use, different access configuration and traffic generation and is no longer relevant as the land uses, uses are not similar. Three, the traffic study completed was prepared specifically for the previous land use. It is not applicable to the proposed development. Even though the scale and intensity of the past development was greater than what is currently proposed, that the traffic study did not recommend signalized intersections as they were not warranted as they did not meet the appropriate threshold at full build out and at the planned horizon. Four, the proposed sketch, first figure of the email from Mr. Hope, as provided contemplates the utilization of the municipal unopened road allowance for the proposed development. It is our understanding the municipality has not made any decisions with respect to the disposition of these lands. No formal request from any party to close the unopened road allowance has been made and this unopened road allowance could provide an option for access slash servicing to the lands known as 95 Mill Street West. Five, the comments suggest second figure and third figure of the email that a road bypass and settlement expansion could be contemplated and that the proposed application would prevent that opportunity. It is our understanding that this would require coordination and support from the adjacent municipality to support the new road and for the conversion of agricultural lands to settlement. We are not aware 
of any such justification, budget, or initiation of any studies to undertake such a proposal. The 2019 draft official plan for the Town of Lakeshore does not provide for either a new proposed road or a settlement expansion. As such, this is not a relevant point. Through the formal pre-submission consultation for the proposed development, a traffic analysis was not required from the municipal staff. The Municipal Technical Advisory Committee has no concerns with the location and proposed limited development in this case and supports it accordingly. Mill Street West is a rural cross section with three lanes, two traveled and one middle center aisle turn lane that would accommodate the existing and proposed development together with the proposed entrances for turning. Therefore, based on the above, and it should be, it should not be about what was potentially considered in the past, but what is before you tonight. The location and limited development proposed in this case being the site that is approximately 1.5 of a larger approximately 30 acre property being only 5% of the overall lands will not negatively impact the orderly of the remaining lands nor future development opportunities of properties in the area. The fundamental question relates to, does the proposed development conform with or is consistent with the public planning policies and staff and their requirements and review of the technical information support the proposed development? We believe this has been fully, pro been fully properly considered within the comprehensive municipal staff recommendation report before you this evening. Our client is anxious to develop the proposed and planned development, which we believe will result in a greater community benefit and further investment to the area. We therefore respectfully request that Council support the staff recommendations in above B17-20 and B18-20 with the conditions of approval as outlined in the staff report. We look forward to participating at the Council meeting tonight via the webinar that link that was provided to us, respectfully submitted on behalf of our clients. That's it, Mayor Caniff. Uh, Mr. Jox, can you do a presentation, please? So, thank you, Mayor Caniff. The subject property is located on the south side of Mill Street West in the community of Tilbury. Uh, the lands in total are approximately 30 acres in area and are currently vacant and farmed. The lands are designated as a future employment area in the Chatham County Official Plan and are within a site-specific policy area that does permit um, a number of commercial uses as well to be established over these lands. Uh, the proposal before Council is to sever and convey one new lot, approximately 1.5 acres in area, from the northwest corner of the subject property to facilitate new commercial development of a proposed gas bar and restaurant. Following the proposed lot creation, the application further proposes to sever the new parcel into two lots so that the gas bar and, ref and restaurant can be held in separate ownership. Uh, so the lots would consist of a uh, 0.8 acre parcel for a combination gas bar and convenience store. And as well, the second lot would be approximately 0.7 acres in area containing a proposed drive through restaurant, uh, which would be a new McDonald's uh, with drive through lane as well. Uh, in addition to the severance application before Council, the developer has submitted two other applications to the municipality for consideration. Uh, these applications are not before Council tonight as they are uh, dependent on the outcome of this uh, severance going forward uh, to some degree. Uh, those include a site plan application, uh, which would lay out the proposed buildings, uh, driveways, parking, servicing, etc., as well as an application to deal with the zoning as the property currently is in a holding zone, uh, which does not permit any development until uh, certain preconditions are met, uh, which is essentially uh, this severance application. As Council has heard, um, there was one letter received as well as the uh, planner for the applicant has uh, responded to that letter. All considered, I do agree with the opinion of the uh, developers planner with regards uh, to the response to the letter received by council in opposition to this proposal. 
Very simply, extension of the Tilbury urban boundary is not planned at this time. Urban boundary expansions to bring new land in to uh, an urban settlement area for residential, commercial, or employment uses uh, would be undertaken at the time of a municipal comprehensive review. Uh, Chatham Kent does plan to undertake a municipal comprehensive review in the next uh, couple of years, uh, culminating in a new um, or updated official plan. Uh, the last comprehensive review was undertaken in 2014. Uh, that being said, uh, Tilbury has in excess of 25 years of land within its urban boundary at this time. Uh, so any expansion would be contingent on, on a demonstrated need uh, at the appropriate time. It should also be noted that lands to the south of this site and west of Tilbury are in the municipality of Lakeshore in the county of Essex. So any expansion uh, in this area uh, would require uh, negotiations and, and annexation of these lands into Chatham-Kent. Uh, it was noted in the that Chatham Kent does own a piece of property uh, directly to the west of this site. Uh, the property was obtained a number of years ago. Um, and it, it is not exactly an unopened road allowance, but certainly would, would lend itself to uh, a new road should one ever be considered for this area to access lands uh, to the west of here, to the south, and even the balance of the subject property. In sum, the proposal conforms to the land use policies of the Child and Ken official plan. And therefore, the application is recommended for approval. Um, one of the comments that we've heard and, and was seriously considered through the uh, development review process was the alignment of a driveway or road with uh, the auto live driveway, their westerly driveway. Um, the current site plan submitted with the application is shown on the screen now. Um, like I said, this is not approved. However, the approximate location of the auto leave driveway is where I've circled uh, in red there. It's sort of at the top of the picture. So this is something that we can revisit uh, with the developer regardless, as it is a best practice to try to align uh, intersections for one. But you know the logic behind that certainly would extend to private driveways. However, the notion that there would be a municipal road that would, would service um, this property and multiple properties well into the future. That's, that's a concept that was never put forward by the previous developer in the mid 2000s, uh, nor by Chatham Kent. Uh, so in reviewing this proposal uh, against Chatham Kent's land use policies, it, it was not in um, the planning opinion nor in the technical opinion of, of administration that there should be a municipal road aligned at this location. Uh, there remains opportunity in the balance of this site further east as well as over the municipal lands directly to the west for future municipal roads should development ever proceed uh, in those areas. Uh, with regard to the recommendation, um, unfortunately I omitted a, uh, a, a very important but small uh, piece in the recommendation number two uh, being for consent application file B18-20. Uh, this is the second consent recommendation that would essentially uh, split the first severed lot in two for the gas bar and restaurant. I've added in this slide number two sub, sub item three that this application should also establish reciprocal easements between parts one and two, this being both sides of the property for shared access parking and servicing. Uh, this would allow the uh, properties to uh, be legally bound to one another for these reasons and function um, appropriately for the type of development that, that is proposed. With that, uh, Mayor Caniff, it is recommended uh, that recommendations one and two as outlined in the planning report uh, with the change I just noted for agenda item 8E be approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacques. Uh, Councillor Harrigan. Hi, thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Um, I would like to move the recommendations and I do have some questions for planning and the developer. Councillor Oche, can I get a second? Yes, you can. And I have some questions as well. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Harrigan. 
Great, thank you. Um, thank you uh, through the mayor to Mr. Jacques for answering questions and providing some information about the roads uh, in response to some of the deputations we received. And also thank you for the uh, information and the back and forth that uh, we've had about this application. Um, can you confirm for me, Ryan, in the application, there is some uh, a diagram that outlines potential proposed roads for further development. Um, I mean, while the other areas of the property um, are not a subject today, would you say that those proposed roadways or access points would be generally in alignment with allowing for further development of the property overall? And I'm referring to figure 11 in the report. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Uh, yes, there is there is opportunity um, for a future access, uh, even being a municipal roadway. Uh, this was noted in the developer's planning justification report. And, and the location of this roadway aligns with the easterly driveway uh, for auto leave. Um, approximately here, if you can see my cursor, this, this road uh, could extend south into the site and eventually in, in the rear of the property to service the lots further west and then potentially in the long term even come back to to Mill Street if required. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm also wondering if uh, it's possible for the developer or those who represent the developer to give us some information about the drive through restaurant going in, uh, first in terms of job creation and typically how many new jobs a restaurant like McDonald's would provide for a community. And then also secondly, in terms of community culture or corporate culture with uh, in terms of relationship to communities. Uh, yes, can I get the uh, developer to make the comment, please? Or the, answer the question? Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Mayor um, Caniff, members of council and municipal staff. Uh, my name is Victor Labresh from the IBI Group, I'm planning practice lead here in the Waterloo office. Also with me um, this evening is Douglas Stewart, uh, manager of planning. Uh, we're certainly at a physical distance, um, but we've worked uh, jointly on this application and are pleased to uh, have you consider it this evening. The, um, as requested or asked by the councillor, the ward councillor, uh, the application does um, include a uh, location for McDonald's on the property. Um, the McDonald's restaurants uh, core culture uh, requirements uh, are to support community benefits and community, including um, commitment to families, youth opportunity, investment in people. Of course, that includes the Ronald McDonald House charities locally and provincially and nationally, um, support of human rights, global diversity, inclusion and community engagement at all levels, gender balance and diversity, and also supporting local farmer livelihoods. Um, and they, these are again, uh, part of their core values and commitments uh, corporately and also through their financial uh, and financing agreements. The, I could add to that, that uh, McDonald's typically in a location um, of this size or larger would hire a minimum of 45 to 55 full and part-time employees. Uh, that are all obviously encouraged to be local. Thank you, um, and thank you for that information. I, um, given that I move the recommendation, I'll obviously support it. I'll also um, encourage my colleagues to support the application because um, not just for the opportunities that it provides our community in Tilbury today, but also because of the interest in this property uh, for the longer term. And I think this is a uh, very d exciting development for our community and I look forward to seeing what is to come. Thank you. Councillor Oche. Thank you, Worship, through you to Ryan. Ryan, the uh, Auto Live East driveway, we're, uh, Melissa was just talking, or Councillor Harrigan was just talking to you about the uh, the road going back. If for some 
great reason. Uh, Tilbury got extremely busy with industrial or anything like that. We could probably put that road right back to uh, to uh, the old 98 or 46 or middle road, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, with the help of Lakeshore saying, yes, we'll let you take this land from us. Uh, is that not correct? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Um, yes, Councilor Che, that, that's generally correct. I, th I think the, the conversation that, um, I guess the conversation that I'd have with anybody around the growth of Tilbury would revolve around um, the geography that we're discussing, like the amount of land, as well as the pace of growth. So, so certainly administration, you know, works hard in the interest of council to, to grow our communities uh, so that they're prosperous. Uh, safe, uh, healthy, and fun, and, and we'll always continue to do that. In this case, the the expanse of time that would likely have to play out before that amount of land um, from you know Mill Street or Number Two to Middle Line and Ninety Eight Highway uh, is is well beyond the the land use planning horizon um, that I can can realistically consider for such a proposal. In Tilbury, um, there is there's still quite a lot of land for in industrial or employment uses. This site being one lands on the north side of Mill Street West. There are some lands north of the 401 on Queen Street and a, a very large amount of land uh, that's that's already uh, has sanitary sewer infrastructure in the ground um, bound by uh, Mill Street East and Wheeler Line. So um, there's a substantial amount of land available. Uh, for employment growth in Tilbury, um, as well, residential growth over the next um, you know, 25 years should be accommodated within within the urban boundary. So, while I don't disagree with you know the overall logic behind a north south connector road between Mill Street and 98, uh, it's it's just something that is so far in advance that the number of changes that will happen in, in our culture and in land use planning practice over that time is just not something that we could make a professional recommendation on at this time. Thank you. Your Worship, um, through you to Ryan again. Uh, realistically, Autolive um, is only busy about three times a day and that's in the morning when the shift goes in in the afternoon when the other shift goes in and that shift leaves or if they're on a 12-hour um, 12 12-hour shift then it's uh, a little later at night so um, realistically there really isn't a lot of traffic coming from auto live throughout the day um, to worry about a, a signal light or basically being connected uh, um is that not correct uh, unfortunately i'm only aware anecdotally of the um you know the shift shift policy at auto leave but that's consistent with what i've heard from others who are more familiar with that facility than i am certainly when there is a shift change you know all the cars come at once and and uh no doubt there's queuing uh, or a lineup on on auto leave which is a private driveway um, from a, a municipal point of view um, our recommendations are based around impacts to to our municipal roadway and how they function and you know in the case of cars waiting to enter onto a municipal roadway um, from a private property i guess very simply that's preferable over cars waiting to exit a municipal roadway onto private property as that causes congestion and safety concerns. Thank you. And just one last question through your worship. Um, the nice thing about Auto Live Drive, and I have a lot of friends that actually work there, so I do know the shifts and I know um, the traffic, how the traffic is there, is that that Auto Live Drive goes around in a 
it's not a circle, but a, a U shaped. And so they they can go out either driveway as well, which is uh, um, cutting down on a box backlog out of just one driveway so uh, um, to me uh, this makes perfectly sense as you were 100% correct on the uh, uh, property being probably 50 to 100 years before we would ever need that road to go straight through uh, um, as this property that's being purchased or looking at being purchased right now has been there well since Tilbury has been made and it's just starting to uh, uh, hopefully have a gas station and a McDonald's and a variety store there. So thank you very much. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Has everybody been able to vote? I understand Councillor Bondi may have lost connection. Councillor Wright, were you able to vote that time? No, but I'll vote yes. Uh, it's on my screen, but it don't work. All right, thank you. And Councillor Harrigan? I was able to vote, thank you. Perfect, okay, all votes are in. Motion passes 17 to zero. Okay, um, 8F, Application for Zoning Bylaw Amendment, First Family Homes, Inc., Lance Boulevard, and Delft Court, Community of Blenheim, South Kent. We have one deputation uh, from Dr. Bruce Warwick, and I'll turn to Meredith. So we have um, Dr. Bruce Warwick, 7850 Grand River Line. The writer owns the farm that is adjacent to the subject property in this application. There should not be any conflict between my farm and the subject property. My farm was resurveyed by Richard W. Murray, land surveyor, Windsor, Ontario, in January 2013. They are and there are clearly visible tall orange painted stakes directly beside the original survey stakes along the northeast property line of my farm and the subject property. On April 18th, 2020, the writer confirmed that these clearly marked stakes will still be in place. There is also a row of trees and brush on my farm property serving as a windbreak to prevent soil erosion. While the writer has no issue with the proposed housing development of this project, it is paramount that all parties concerned here, the developer, Chatham-Kent Administration and Chatham-Kent Council are clearly aware that the property boundary is not infringed upon or altered in any way. This refers to the property stakes as well as the tree line. The writer is submitting this letter as proof of verification of the boundary line and the foliage as well as proof of notification to all parties concerned that any damage or alteration to the above will be dealt with through litigation, holding all of the above stated parties accountable. This letter may appear somewhat heavy handed. However, in 1983, our 150-year-old undisturbed farm laneway on the west side of the farm was unilaterally and without our consent or knowledge plowed under by the neighboring farmer and planted with his crop. This resulted in two years of aggressive, lit aggressive litigation. The writer will not be subject to any round. The writer will not be subject to another round of this litigation expropriation of property from this proposed new home development. In conclusion, please be advised that all parties, as stated above, have been notified in the writer's concerns and the latter is fully prepared to take whatever action is determined necessary if our property and boundaries are infringed upon again. Yours truly, Dr. Bruce Warwick. Uh, Mr. Jacques, can you provide a brief presentation, please? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. I'll jump right to it. Um, the entire uh, subdivision was approved in 2004. This is by First Family Homes, care of uh, Mr. Henry Retz. Uh, the draft approved lots all the way at the back of the farm currently uh, do abut 
the Laird Farm as noted in the letter. This is marked in red on the screen. It's not proposed to be changed with this application through consultation with the applicant. Uh, they've conveyed that they do respect the property line, are aware of the letter, and, um, and, and will note that for their file going forward. This application has the effect on the land circled in blue to add additional housing types, being semi-detached dwellings and townhomes to the zoning, uh, which were not contemplated for this area in 2004 originally. And this phase would be consistent with uh, the prior phases of the Lands Park subdivision. Uh, therefore, it is recommended that the zoning bylaw amendment as described in the planning report be approved. Thank you. Yes, uh, Councillor Latimer. I'd like to move the recommendation, please. Okay, Councillor Sakachi. I'll be the second it, Your, your, your Honor. Any, any questions? Seeing none, we'll put it to vote. Judy, uh, it's John here, yeah. Okay, so you vote yes, and uh, Councillor Bondi has not been able to log back in yet, so all votes are in, motion passes 17 to zero. HG, application for zoning bylaw amendment, 1181513 Ontario Inc, 6 Talbot Street West, Community of Blenheim, South Kent. We have not received any deputations uh, for this application, Your Worship. Is there any questions you have of administration? Uh, seeing none, what is the will of the council? Councillor Latimer. I move the recommendation. Okay, uh, Councillor Sakachi. I'll be the second. Hearing no other questions, so we'll put it to vote. Judy, it's John again. It's a yes. Great. Is there anyone else who was not able to submit their vote? Okay, all votes are in. Motion passes 16 to 0. That's it for planning services, Your Worship. We now move on to the regular agenda. Okay, we'll we'll start with the consent agenda. Okay, sorry, any deputations? Yes, we have one deputation for the regular uh, agenda. It is on 11A, Scott Aikens. And um, Mr. Aikens has asked that we read the following. First off, I'd like to thank all of you for putting this out to our communities for our input. It shows we are on the right path to the solution. Once this decision is made, it's a decision that cannot turn back for generations and any new newcomers to come. I should clarify that 11A is with regards to the baseline bridge over the Sydenham River in Wallaceburg. I'm asking for council to consider option four to be postponed to a later date for a number of reasons and recommendations. A, shutting these two bridges down, landlock boats from homeowners that have boats already that require these bridges open. B, in your report, it shows an average of 18% to 22% still want these two bridges movable. C, there is nothing wrong with looking at fixed bridges, but my recommendation is to look at the cost to raise them. You have pointed out to be like Chatham, 20 feet clearance, fixed bridge. D, we don't need 20 feet, but I ask that an investigation into an acceptable height we can all live with. E, during Wambo weekend, there are boats that travel down through Murray Street Bridge for weekend stays. F, there is an annual boating runs from Wallaceburg up to Dresden every year. G, I'm afraid once you start a precedent of fixed bridges, it will snowball to the next three after that. And H, large and most important, closing the door on tourism. 
I would ask Council to consider a motion or give a direction of having a task force assembled for strictly tourism on Wallaceburg and Chatham waterways. We have a gold mine right here in Chatham Kent and I think with a little bit of teamwork and creativity we make Chatham Kent the best place to boat to. There are also many possibilities if we work together to make this happen. Here are a couple of possibilities or ideas to think about. It is a great idea of a new walkway you have shown in the report uptown. I recommend we each we reach out to flow through right here in Wallaceburg that makes this decking and ask them for their assistance and also have them look at replacing the two loading ramps at the existing boat launch on Gillard Street. This boat ramp is all that is needed if it is done up right. What better way to help our own and buy right here in Chatham Kent? I recommend the addition of a series of finger docks be added all behind the library to start with. The going rate of any marina is roughly $1.50 US funds per foot per night. This is where it gets really sad to think we are missing out on a huge market out there. Promotion from Detroit all the way down to Port Huron, there are recorded 10,000 seasonal occupied boating slips. There is no reason Chatham Kent cannot attract our share of weekend boaters. Assembly, assembling a task force can identify what we need to do to get to this market. That US dollar can be ours. Both our waterways used to be completely full every weekend. I'm a believer that with a little bit of creativity that will that we can make this work and it would snowball to help so many other businesses prosper. We have the water, we have the transit system, we have the casino, and not to mention all the restaurants in both cities. Weekend voters spend money and they are our best friends for free advertisement of Chatham Kent because each voter tells their entire back home marinas how great of a time they have had on their weekend away. Thank you for your time and I really hope for your consideration. Let's grow Chatham Kent and not shut the door. Okay, we'll go to item 10, count, uh, the uh, consent agenda. Currently there are four items asked to be removed, 11A, 11C, 12B, and 13A. Is there any other items that would be want removed? Hearing none. Oh, so Councillor McGrail. Yes, can I get um, Councillor Lee's comments on to come out, please. Okay. Uh, can I, uh, Council McGrail, can I get a motion then to accept all the other items? You sure can. Uh, Councillor Hall, can I get a seconder on that? Yes, absolutely. I'll second. Thanks. Okay. Uh, anyone opposed? Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, we'll put it to vote then. It's John again. It's a yes. Thank you. Everybody else has submitted. And welcome back, Councillor Bondi. All votes are in. Motion passes. Yes. Uh, item 11A. Sorry, my fault. Uh, tender award contract T19 417, structural and mechanical rehabilitation of baseline bridge over Sydenham River, community of Wallaceburg. Councillor C. McGregor. Um, yes, I'd like to move that, please. Uh, Councillor Hall. Yes, I will second that. Okay, back to you, Councillor McGregor, for questions. Can you can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. For I, I 
think Judy went through and muted us all and caught me off guard there. Um, yes, actually, uh, before we get going on this, um, my fellow councillor Aaron Hall, I think, has an amendment he'd like to make to this. So before we speak to it, it might be more prudent for all of us to listen to his motion and we can discuss that first and it might save us a lot of uh, discussion this evening. So thank you. Uh, councillor Hall, do you, do you want to prove uh, to you? Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor Caniff. I do have an amendment uh, and thank you, uh, Councillor McGregor. Um, I do have an amendment to make to the original motion. Um, so I move that recommendation number four in the report be separated from the original motion and sent back to staff for more information. Furthermore, before coming back to council with a report on the possibility of launch launching an investigation into movable bridges, staff will set up a meeting with Transport Canada to discuss the Navigable Waters Act and how it applies to Wallaceburg and Chatham Kent overall. This report will also include details related to the decision-making process behind changing the community of Chatham's movable bridges to fixed bridges, specific consultation and discussions with Walpole Island First Nation and the St. Clair Region Conservation Authority must be included in any future investigation. And lastly, any future investigation and consultation will focus on all movable bridges in Chatham Kent. And that's my amendment, Mayor Kenna. And I would like to second that motion. Yes, Councillor you will second it. Okay, yes, uh, back to you, Councillor Hall, to discuss your motion. Yes, thank you. I will. Uh, I will discuss this uh, amendment. Um, uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I believe the. Uh, I believe it needs more work, specifically uh, uh, recommendation number four, uh, especially regarding the discussion with Transport Canada. Uh, and also gathering more information about the past decision making for changing changing the bridges in Chatham. I know we received email a couple of hours ago, um, but I'd like more time to review that uh, myself and with the community uh, and have staff some provide some more input uh, on that uh, before we vote, before us as a council vote on conducting this investigation. Um, I believe also Mr. Atkins, who provided a deputation, and thank you to Scott for, for doing that. I thought he had some good ideas that we could explore as well uh, before we move forward with this investigation. Um, I think recommendation four is a separate issue. I'd like to see this sent back to staff, as I said, uh, this deal with the baseline bridge report and work tonight um, and deal with uh, recommendation four at a later time. I have, along with Councilman McGregor, I know, uh, have a list of questions, which, uh, you know, if we send recommendation four back, we won't require immediate answer answers to it. Um, but they mostly come from the community when discussing the issue of changing the service levels to bridges. Uh, just quickly for an example, people are concerned about their insurance rates. If barges are unable to come into town and conduct emergency repairs, there are many questions about ice breaking activities and protocols for the Sydenham River. Some were concerned about the connecting links program and the eligib eligibility criteria when changing service levels to bridges. Um, and there's also some concern about potential fines from the federal government for not abiding by the Navigable Waters Act. Um, we also received a lot of feedback from various community groups and, and boating enthusiasts and groups like WAMBO and the Chamber of Commerce, the BIA, the Dragon Boat Festival. They were all speaking about the importance of the waterways uh, to the identity of the community of Wallaceburg, uh, both, both in the, the past and, and present, uh, but also looking at opportunities in the future, uh, specifically related to tourism or economic development. So, after we deal with this amendment tonight, I do have a few more questions uh, for staff as well related to recommendations one, two, and three. Um, but those are all my comments right now. So thank you, Mayor Kenna. Councillor C. McGregor. Um, thank you, uh, and through the mayor. And yes, this uh, I fully support this recommendation to send it back. I do have questions on on item number four. I have other questions on the other first three, but it'd be prefer to deal with this first. So like I know in the, in this report, it mentions four of the five bridges need rehabilitation in the next few years, assuming one of those is the baseline bridge. So that leaves all other movable bridges remaining that apparently need to be rehabilitated within the next four years. Um, to me, that kind of seems like poor planning, considering, uh, like in my view, considering the cost of bridge rehabilitations. Um, I've asked for the engineering reports on 
on both the Dundas and the Murray Street Bridge and also the 20 year master plan from the engineering transportation department. Um, I'm not yet to receive, but you know, that's understandable because you know, there really just hasn't been time, which is part of the reason why, why I think this should go back. Um, also, there's reference in the survey to point number five. It says in the survey uh, reports, 38% of residents uh, support the concept that this type of service level should be paid for by the community. So in, in my questions, and, and I, will, I would like these answered if this doesn't get referred, but if, if it does, then we can deal with this at a later date. But um, what is the number of people that actually responded? What is that 38% and how many of them are from Wallaceburg um, that actually live here and use our waterways? And if this uh, future direction of CK um, in there, uh, if it's the future direction of Chad and Kent, then there are many other projects that we also need to look at um, through this type of a lens and not sure that's where we want to go. And what does it say? I'd also like to know what it says in the amalgamation documents. I've asked for those documents uh, uh, to receive information, um, have not received. Again, you know, I, I can't really expect in this short period of time, it's just been literal, literally over a week that uh, Aaron and I had a in-depth discussion with the engineering department, the CAO and our solicitors. So I, I understand why I don't have those in my hands at this time. So again, another reason to go back. And if you're curious why I might be asking about amalgamation, well, um, in the past, it's been explained to me um, as a counselor that when we went into amalgamation, and, and I'll use this as an example, that you know if we had a tar and chip road, at the time of amalgamation, then this is the service level that's maintained going forward. Otherwise, it becomes a community. Councillor McGregor, we seem to have lost you. Um, can you tell me at what point you lost me, Judy? Uh, probably just last 20 seconds. Okay, so I was saying as um if you have a tarnship road at the time if you had a tarnship road at the time of amalgamation it's explained to me that if you wanted it increased say to a paved road then it becomes a a uh an improvement a community improvement or a neighborhood improvement therefore needs to be paid for by those so you know i would like to see the documents and what is mentioned in in regards to the bridges because we came into amalgamation with movable bridges so I'm thinking if there's an infrastructure requirements that require the same service level. So, and, and I don't really want to go there again. Um, you know, this is probably things that need to come out through a full consultation with many, many partners. So not being said, you know, I, I've, I've, I asked my fellow counselor and, and, and he's brought forward a motion to refer this back to staff to do a fulsome study to better understand the options and also hopefully understand the uniqueness of this community whether it be um, whether we're looking at uh, um, our culture um, the abilities that can happen within the community and i know there they list there's many options listed uh, in in the report um, for you know possible things that could happen if we set, if we make our bridges immovable like you know we could put other docks in or we could improve the river waterfront all in through the the core in the downtown well you know i don't think these are trade-offs for making a decision to close our bridges that we get improvement and i don't think any of us in any of our communities really want to go there so i really hope that uh, rather than go into a, a long fulsome discussion tonight that that uh, we can just move this motion forward and send it back to staff for for proper consultation and and at that point then all of council can have input but i'll leave it i'll leave it there thanks thank you mayor Pan. okay uh we'll entertain questions regarding to 11a number four and then we'll vote on that one and then we'll go to the one 11a one, two, and three. So, uh, Councillor Kirkwood White, do you have a question related to 11A Part Four? Yes, Your Worship. Thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, lend my support for the amendment to the main motion. 
Uh, I was not involved as many of the current councillors uh, were not involved at the time that uh, the decision was made to make the to make the bridges in Chatham permanent and uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the rationale that was uh, involved in making those decisions and the impact on local tourism and uh, wondering whether the same arguments were proposed as part of the decision making uh, prior to amalgamation when these decisions were, ma were made about Chatham. So I am going to support the amendment to the main motion and hope that we can uh, engage a number of community partners, particularly those that are in the tourism area to, uh, to give us some good advice on uh, the direction that we should take. Councillor Pinsonal. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I have no, no problem supporting this going back and having a look at it. I guess my question, I'm not even sure who I'm addressing it to is, that bridge we put in, I'm going to guess it's about four or five years ago. It was a walk bridge, uh, which goes up to the to the downtown of Wallsburg. Was was that a um, a raisable bridge at the time? I, I don't remember. Thank you, Mayor Camp. This is uh, Chris T. Bear here, Director of Engineering. Uh, that would be the L.O. Stone L.O. Stonehouse Bridge. It's a pedestrian bridge, and yes, it is in fact a movable uh, lifting bridge. Uh, for navigable waterway traffic. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, we'll put item 11A number four to vote, which is on the screen right now. So we're voting for just that. We're not voting for currently for 11A one, two, or three. Just giving you an extra second, Council, to read that to make sure you know what you're voting on. Okay, please vote. Maybe it's John, it's a yes. Great, thank you. So all votes are in, motion passes 18 to zero. Okay, with that, we'll go to uh, item 11A, one, two, and three. Uh, Councillor C. McGregor, did you wanna make any comments prior to uh, opening the floor to other questions? Um, yes, actually, uh, Mayor Canafin, I won't be nearly as long and um, first, I'd like to thank the engineering department for putting the report together to begin with, because I know there's a lot of work into this and we have a lot of work to go. So um, I just have a, a couple of questions and uh, I just one I would like, uh, I know we, we read about the, uh, the override system that was installed um, um, because of the bridge getting stuck when it was open. I'm just curious if we have had any issues of the bridge being stuck open since the override system has gone in. Thank That's you, Mayor one Kemp. I have one oh. more. Sorry, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor Kemp. So the, uh, we're not aware of any uh, challenges that, that we've had uh, with the electronic capabilities of opening the bridge. However, uh, with, with regards to the mechanical, we are still having concerns with the uh, relatching of the of the bridge when it's actually swung back into place again, which is what we're looking to address uh, under this contract. Thank you, Chris, and and yes, and I do and I do realize some of that. Uh, Councillor Hall and I actually went down and toured the bridge and underneath the bridge and and saw the override system that was installed and stuff. So um, I'm happy to hear that. I know that's not a long term fix, but that's at least a temporary fix, I think, from what I understood. So um, my next question is is um, with the new tender award, the T19417, I'm just wondering why was the electrical and mechanical issued together again, um, especially after the failure of the responses to the T18160, we, we had no responses. Um, it, it appears um, to me that it's difficult to get a company that can do both the mechanical and the electrical. So they actually, what they have to actually do is hire somebody in to come and do the mechanical 
And again, it's resulting in a premium um, charged back to us because then they're now running the middle of that or hiring. And maybe that's just a normal process, but I'm just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm curious. I, I want this, these, uh, these motions, both one, two and three to pass. And I do support these, but I'm just curious as to why we would reissue a tender the same as what we did in 2018 when we didn't get any response. Yes, thank you, Mayor Kemp. So the, uh, with regards to tender T, uh, let me get the number, T18-160, yeah. this was released back in 2018. Uh, yes. That was for the mechanical and the electrical component. And uh, as identified on page two and three of the report, uh, we did not receive any bids for that combined tender. And we, in fact, had to therefore cancel and move forward with a, a separate tender for the electrical and we, we held off on doing the mechanical component because the electrical is what was uh, most critical to complete uh, as quickly as possible. So what we pro proceeded with uh, was a single source uh, contract uh, in October 2018 for the electrical rehabilitation only. And we have not completed yet the mechanical uh, component of that initial tender. Uh, so now what we have left is mechanical and what was later ad identified through uh, additional detailed uh, uh, inspection and OSIN inspection of the bridge was that we now have some uh, structural concerns with the bridge that need to be addressed as well. So now we have two, one element that carried forward, which is the mechanical and a new element, which is a structural, which now consists of the new contract T19417, which you see here today. And, uh, and it's true is that uh, the, with the mechanical being tacked onto it, uh, we did have two, uh, I guess, uh, reputable structural contractors bid on this project uh, that are known for doing a lot of our structural uh, bridge projects. The challenge that we have is with the mechanical, uh, where they obviously have to sub out that work and, and get a sub subcontractor involved. Uh, which we're having a lot of difficulty finding just because of the the complexity of the work and dealing with movable bridges. There's not really a lot of uh, appetite out there for uh, for that type of uh, contractor and that type of work. So it was a bit of a challenge to find uh, mechanical expertise and and uh, hence the the why we're assuming that the contract came in much higher than what it did is because of the challenges that we have with uh, um, trying to uh, maintain these these bridges as movable bridges. Um, thank you, Chris, because that's a much more eloquent and, and much more detailed um, statement as what I asked. And But my question goes back to is why we would reissue the two together again after it failed um, a year and a half ago. Like, why would we go back out to tender with the two put back together again as opposed to starting with separate tenders from the start? Uh, it's... it's uh... It's standard for us to try and combine the works together into one contract in a means to try and find the most cost-effective solution possible. Uh, of course, there is the opportunity to split up this tender, which is ultimately recommendation number three in this report. If we're not successful with the uh, negotiations to bring this down to a budget, uh, a budget that we're comfortable with or that we budgeted for, uh, we will be proceeding with this as two individual uh, contracts and, and, and going out to uh, to tender individually. Uh, but again, the, this is two completely different. The electrical is complete and no longer part of this project. We're only dealing with mechanical and the new structural element. So now we, we never combine mechanical and structural before. That's new for this contract. Uh, we tried again because it, it's, we're always trying to find ways to, uh, um, to find the most cost effective means possible to get these tenders out. And we were hopeful that by combining the work and trying to reduce the amount of, of, uh, of, of a contractor A coming in and, and uh, with mobilization, demobilization and two different contracts, uh, there, there's always a benefit to combining the work and combining under one contract for management. But, uh, but of course, if not, if unsuccessful, uh, based on, on number three of this report, uh, we will proceed with two different contracts. Thank you very much, Chris, and, and I certainly hope that we are successful with uh, number one and we don't have to do that. And I hope that maybe going through in the future, if we have issues in this sort where we have difficulty and they're putting two, two separate proceeds together and, and we understand that there's limited companies and different things that can do this, that, that we reconsider. Um, and, I, and I know this was meant to save money and I think this is proven to the fact, 
proven by what's going on here that it's not saving money. So I hope that uh, you would use it, uh, take it back as kind of one of those lessons learned and in the future that we would uh, be able to uh, maybe consider looking at some of the things, some of these separates so that we don't run into these issues. But thank you so much, Chris. Uh, what an excellent uh, uh, explanation you've given and I, and I greatly appreciate uh, the help you've given me in the last week or so with some of the understanding. Thank you. Councillor Hall. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Yeah, a few more, uh, uh, just a few questions here. Uh, Chris or Thomas, can you speak to, I know we talked, or you mentioned Chris a, a little bit about the, the, me the mechanical work that needs to happen, um, but can you just speak to the immediate need for the, the structural work that needs to happen that's included in this report? The, like the immediate need for that to happen. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Yes, yeah, certainly. So uh, as part of this contract for the structural components, we are looking to address the fatigue structural steel supporting sidewalks. Uh, this bridge is actually a unique kind of cantilevered system where the sidewalks um, uh, extrude uh, uh, beyond the limits of the girders of the bridge. Uh, so they're kind of hanging off the ed edge of the bridge. Um, so they are, uh, we're, we're noticing some spalled concrete sidewalks and curbs and the decks and the abutments and the piers, uh, which is creating a safety concern, not only for pedestrians, but also for vehicular. If any of the vehicles are, were to uh, drive on the sidewalk or impact the sidewalk or large vehicles by any way, uh, that is a, a great concern for us for, for failure source and something that we need to address uh, sooner than later. Um, in addition to seeing the uh, deteriorated asphalt wearing surface on the actual approach spans and the swing span and uh, the, the misaligned deck drains for proper drainage on the deck itself. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. And, and this comes from a local resident. So once uh, this work is approved and it begins, what's the timeline for the project? Yes, so per uh, per the tender contract, um, works may commence any time after council approval with substantial completion being, uh, we have to identify in the report as August 2020, uh, but basically it's about four to five months in total to complete both the mechanical and the structural elements of this project. Um, just to, to, to split it up, it's almost a 50-50, a so the mechanical would be about two months and then the structural would be another two months, um, plus or minus. If, okay, if I could perfect. add, uh, it's, it's Thomas uh, Kelly, the general manager of IES. So uh, we need to discuss that with the contractor. Uh, with everything going on with COVID, uh, we, the original contract, uh, they did not have the information of COVID. They may be having trouble uh, acquiring employees as well. So we'd like to uh, go back to that contractor, assume we'll get a successful negotiation and then renegotiate the, the, the completion time as well. I think in fairness to them, there's been a lot of changes. So um, I'd like to pause on uh, any commitment to timing at this time until we speak with the contractor. That, that make, that's fair, uh, Thomas, and I appreciate that. If you can just keep, uh, keep us informed uh, throughout the process, that'd be great. Um, and, and as well, just uh, to go along with that, if, if a negotiation, I know that's part of, our, uh, part of the report here, if the negotiation with the contractor isn't successful, and uh, and basically recommendation three in the report you know becomes the way we move forward what are those next steps and how does that kind of change the timeline and when can we expect the tenders back before council thank you mayor camp so if we proceed with uh, two separate tenders and contracts we would basically give we'd have to give the instruction to our consultant who is assisting with this project to prepare two separate contract documents now instead of the one combined uh, it's not a lot of effort because it's basically taking the information that's contained in one and splitting it into the two uh, we would put them out individually uh, and give a little bit of time in between and like uh uh, Thomas indicated as well, one thing that we're doing with our tenders is allowing more time for contractors to actually bid on these projects uh, because of the current situation to take everything in proper consideration, get in touch with all of their uh, their their suppliers and all their manufacturers and uh, and put together a proper timeline. So we're probably looking uh, to get another tender out for for this within uh, uh, within the next couple months uh, with uh, bringing back forward to council again, a recommendation to proceed or whatever the outcome may be uh, uh, mid-summer, early to mid-summer. Okay, excellent. And then if, uh, and, and that negotiation with the contractor will happen right away? Yes, that's true. Uh, following this uh, direction from council tonight, we will proceed with uh, setting up a, a uh, 
a teleconferencing discussion with the contractor, of course, uh, maintaining social distancing, and uh, we'll have that discussion with him. And then we will definitely uh, inform council of the outcome before proceeding. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Chris. And, and through you, uh, Mayor Camp, I just have a couple more comments to make. I appreciate the, the time tonight. And first of all, I just want to thank the the community uh, of Wallaceburg and, and surrounding communities for stepping up and engaging throughout this process. I know we had a public information center back before this whole uh, COVID pandemic. It seems like about a year ago, but it was uh, just a couple months ago um, and it was very well attended. I know the the survey responses, um, you know, there was over 900 survey responses and dozens of emails and messages. Um, so I, I just want to tell the community, I appreciate your input and, and your voices were heard loud and clear to keep the baseline bridge a movable structure. Uh, and and your, your voices and your input definitely made an in, impact. So thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank administration and, and Chris and, and Thomas and, and your team uh, for putting this report together and organizing it. Um, I know we had some gr good discussions. We didn't always agree along the way, but I, I appreciate your willingness to to engage with uh, not only with the community, uh, but uh, with Councillor McGregor and I as well. And I believe these uh, these three recommendations that are remaining in the report, this is the most prudent way forward. Um, it listens to what the consultants recommends. It follows along with the feedback we've heard from the community to keep the bridge a movable structure. Uh, and it also looks to, to get the project back on budget by negotiating a price with the contractor, which is beneficial to all the all the taxpayers in Chatham Kent. So I'm hoping for council support. And thank you for the time. Uh, Councillor Sagachi. Thank you through your through your worship uh, uh, to either Mr. Kelly or Mr. T Bear. Uh, I've received a couple uh, questions too, and I guess I just wanted to if you could uh, respond in kind of layman terms in regards to how does number two look. Um, if number one, you know, if it's significantly higher with the number. So, you know, when you get the, uh, you know, the, the dual bid back, if that comes to that, how does that look there? And is there a specific number that you are looking at uh, um, that would be too, too costly, so to speak? Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. So the recommendation in number one um, and, and ultimately number two, uh, is to bring it back to within a, uh, as we identified, within 10% of the engineer's estimate. So the number that we're ultimately looking for is the value not to exceed 2.2 million, including HST. Uh, so that is essentially a reduction to his current tender or to his current bid of about $800,000. 800 to 900,000, sorry. Correct, okay, thank you. I just kind of wanted to see what, so, and then the last thing too is, because of the other movable structures have you guys look are you guys going to be looking at moving forward as well doing the, the basically the similar that we you did on this way here because i know that councillor mcgregor and councillor halls kind of really appreciated the way that uh it's uh it's moved forward i just wanted to see if this is going to be kind of the same similar process i know there were some kind of things some things tweaked along the way um it's just that uh you know there is a lot of questions coming in from from outside communities as well especially from uh from you know folks that uh in chatham regarding you know one community remaining the same uh sorry remaining move movable and you know the fact that chatham lost lost there so so i appreciate the fact that like i said i wasn't uh around at that time as well so i appreciate the the consulting with the the community but uh um you know as long as it makes sense and i think that you guys did a really good job um you know quantifying the different uh um ways we could save money so i appreciate that Councilor mcgrail thank you mayor Kenneth. quick question um the train bridge um first question do we own that thank you mayor kenneth no we do not own the railway bridge thank you second question that in the future um they the owners decide to um eliminate the moving part of that bridge does that hinder this bridge uh, yeah, so this obviously will present challenges um, for the uh, for the for the new owners of the railway bridge. Obviously, when they proceed to rehabilitate that bridge, because it is in, um, we're not aware of the current condition of it because we have not, it, uh, with it not being owned by us, we haven't been uh, on top of it or probably maintaining it. But I am familiar that it is in need of repair, and it will obviously then present a challenge to the owner of the uh, of the new railway bridge to proceed with it. 
uh, down that route because it will be much more expensive and costly for this for the o new owner to uh, uh, maintain it as a movable bridge rather than a fixed bridge. And and I don't know if uh, Thomas, if you have anything more to add to that. Well, it, thank you, Chris. If you look at the uh, PIC information in the report, we have a slide entitled Wallaceburg Bridge Locations. And number one is the baseline bridge. It's the far south bridge. But next in line is the railway bridge. So if there are challenges there on, uh, that's also a swing bridge as well, very similar to the baseline bridge. So uh, if that becomes an issue for this company, uh, effectively that would uh, eliminate any further movement uh, for boats that cannot get under that particular structure. So it's a valid point. Uh, it will be a challenge for them. Some of the figures we presented in the report of the overall expense uh, certainly is going to apply to them as well. Okay, have we approached the owners of that bridge to kind of fill them out and how, um, you know, maybe going forward what their thoughts are? Chris, I can take that one. Uh, we notified them of the PIC and asked for their input and uh, they did not respond. I, I think, you know, they're out of town and they're not within the community, so it's very difficult for them. I, I can do that if uh, council would like me to reach out to them. Okay, that's my questions, thank you. Seeing no other questions, uh, we'll put the, the to vote. Sorry, uh, Councillor Salmon. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm just trying to, in my mind, summarize what I've what I've heard here tonight. So I'm going to ask some simple questions that may just have yes or no's. So how much is this? Is this about nine hundred thousand dollars over the current budget, or is it more than that? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Uh Yes, it is approximately nine hundred thousand over the engineer's estimate. Okay. How many mechanical bridges are there in Ontario? Do you have any idea? Uh, if by way of saying mechanical, you mean movable bridges, yes. there is uh, approximately 36 bridges in Canada. And how many are in Wallsburg? Uh, we have six of them. So I, I asked Ontario, I thought, but maybe it's Canada. So 36 in all of Canada and six in Wallsburg. Correct. Okay. Um, hmm. So the question that uh, Councillor McGrail asked with respect to the railway, they're a business. And you've given us numbers that if we were a business, we'd make a decision one way. But because there are community concerns, we're making a decision another way. And I'm just wondering why, why we would think that a business, which is the next bridge, is going to decide anything other than in a business way. Maybe that's rhetorical. Um, so if we spend this money on this bridge, am I right that the maintenance costs are substantially higher than they are on a fixed span bridge? Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Yes, that is correct. The uh, the maintenance costs uh, of this bridge um, are approximately, um, I believe, a million dollars um, annually. Oh, well, that's for all the bridges in Wallsburg to maintain them as movable right. bridges. Okay. Well, I'm just I'm just trying to get through my head. We go ahead with this um, for a community based reason. And the railway company, or whoever it is, well, it's a, some kind of railway company, says, well, we're making our decision based on business factors. Um, we've just spent that money to, for naught because you can't get past the railway bridge then. Am I right? Uh, yes, that is correct. So the, with the railway bridge being the next one upstream of the baseline bridge, uh, that there are the decision and, and the ultimate solution of that bridge would would uh, impact uh, any decision that we make on any of the future bridges uh, that are municipally owned. Right. 
Because you can't get by there if, if it's a fixed span bridge. Well, I guess you can if you drop your mast or you don't have too high a bridge on your um, boat. Correct. You'll still be able to travel under the bridge. Okay. Okay. I, those are all the questions I had except one. I saw the last boat and the clerk reported it unanimous, but the uh, bars that appeared after the vote showed that it wasn't unanimous. There was sure. a no vote. Well, we'll have to get the, rec we get the recordings after. It's not like the ones that we do um, in the chambers where it's immediate. So it will be properly done. It's just a matter of reporting out. So that was my error, sorry. Yeah, it just didn't show 100%. It showed 94% uh, and 6%, that's all. Yes, and with Councillor Wright doing a manual vote, I think that's where the confusion was. Okay, thank you. Councillor Oche followed by Councillor Sakachi. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Chris, I don't believe the railroad, they can actually just close that bridge, correct? Do they not have to get permission from the um, the government on uh, navigable waterways? Yes, thank you, Mayor Camp. So the, uh, yes, they would be required to consult and go through the Transport Canada slash Navigable Waterways Act process uh, if they were to consider moving forward with a, a non-movable versus movable bridge, the same process that we would be faced with um, and that we are, are recommending to proceed with uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, through you again, Your Worship. So it's not necessary that necessarily that they may be able to close it. And secondly, um, would Thomas mentioned he could contact him and that would be great if they could because uh, uh, like Councillor Solomon said, we don't want to build a movable bridge and then find out that uh, the railroad company is going to talk to uh, Transport Canada and see if they can close it. So uh, it would be nice to have all the information we could get before we say, yeah, let's go with this bridge at this price. So, um, so that that would be something you would be doing, Thomas, for sure. Uh, yes, I said I would do that. However, the decision you're making tonight is if you approve item one, two, one, two, and three, you're giving us direction to go ahead and fix that first bridge in line. So I appreciate the comment. I just want council to be aware that if you're giving us this approval, we're gonna move forward. Uh, the timing may not align with discussions and decisions by the other company who's operating the railway bridge. Okay, thank you, through you again, your worship. Um, Thomas, how, or Chris, sorry, either or how, out of shape is this bridge in that uh could we defer it to sorry. find out if sorry sorry uh councillor oj can i cut in for a second i just want to know we we don't know what the company has intended to do with that railway so i guess i would like to avoid any other discussion as to hypothesizing whether they're going to uh whether it's going to be operational or what it might be so i, I just if we need to go further to that, I would suggest that we go to a closed session. So if there's any other questions related to that, uh, let me know and we'll put a motion to go to a closed session. Otherwise, if we can just uh, continue on with other questions. Well, uh, okay, if I could, Your Worship, I just, it's really hard to make a one point, or I'm sorry, 900,000 over budget uh, decision tonight when we don't know if it makes any sense to do this or not. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Sakachi. I apologize, uh, Your Worship, for, for having it for a second time, but uh, uh, my co-counselors have made some very valid points, and I just wanted to touch base with Thomas there regarding um, how detrimental would, uh, to, to what uh, Councillor Oche said, how detrimental would it be to, to defer this? Because uh, I think Councillor McGrail made some very, very valid points, and, and I'll be uh, uh, first to admit that I didn't even consider those points. So uh, I just wanted to see how detrimental a deferral would be on this uh, potential project? Well, first, first off, is that uh, we have a an ex the current contract that we do have with the recommendation. It would expire within, I think, it's a couple of weeks. 
uh, we've already got an extension from the contractor on this particular one. So that's the first thing that this pricing you have here would expire. It doesn't mean that we couldn't get the same price at a later date. Um, it just, I just need to inform council that it would expire. The second thing is the structural issues. Uh, we do have some concerns about that. We can look into it. We can come back to council. We would probably have to put some level of restrictions on the bridge, uh, particularly on the sidewalks. So it could be, you know, no travel on the sidewalks, that type of thing that we'd have to restrict access on that particular bridge for a period of time uh, until we have this all sorted out. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kelly. I appreciate that. I'm not sure if Mark was um, seeking it to de deferral or if, uh, if that's something he was interested in or not. Sorry, Councillor OJ, I apologize. Okay, uh, any final words then from Councillor Hall? Oops. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Ken. If, uh, no, I think I've said all the all the points that I had to make. You know, our uh, our community spoke uh, spoke loud and clear uh, here to uh, to keep this as a movable structure. Um, I think there's uh, there's many components that uh, that it benefits the community of uh, of Wallaceburg in terms of you know uh, practical issues as well as uh, you know that we didn't go into too much detail about. Uh, you know, when you talk about uh, you know con people concerns with uh with insurance if there's not if they're not able to get barges into the downtown core into the into the residents that live along the the Sydenham river um other practical uh concerns as well and and then talking about some of the other uh community benefits that there is to it um i think there's a lot of opportunity there uh to uh you know to work with our tourism department uh to work with uh economic development uh to work with our community groups that uh uh, you know, to make that to celebrate the, you know, the 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 focal point and, and what uh, what really makes uh, the community of Wallsford unique. I think that's something to celebrate, and I think this is uh, this is something that's uh, necessary in order to uh, uh, realize that full potential and, and and look at some of those opportunities. So I'm hoping for the support and uh, from council tonight for the for the three recommendations. And last thought, uh, any comments from uh, Councillor Steve McGregor? Councillor McGregor, we can't hear yeah, you. If sorry. You're... Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yes, and I would just again uh, reiterate. Uh, uh what council hall said and i hope that we'll have some support for this i just want to bring a couple of things to the attention of a couple of questions um number one we are not making a decision nine hundred thousand dollars over because if this if they cannot renegotiate at the 10 percent over then they will this contract or this uh um, rfp will be dissolved and they will go back out again so um, I think that was Councillor Oche who was worried about making a decision of over 900,000 over. That is not what you're doing tonight. Number two, um, part of us sending uh, the other portion back for further study was to involve the federal government. And it's my understanding that if, if you close a bridge without federal, federal permission, you are looking at fines of up to uh, 250,000 with a directive to have to remake the bridge movable. And it's my also understanding that this process takes, could take at least a year to get through to get those answers. So um, I, you know, and I know we've talked about the mechanics of this bridge and the structure of this bridge. Having gone on the tour under it uh, with Councillor Hall, the structure is definitely in need. So if this falls apart, I hope that they can quickly get something together for the structure of this. The mechanical and the engine, the electrical on this, you no, know, it's not in the best shape and it does need to be changed. But you know, if we have to wait to recontract or whatever, it, it's my understanding that that it, the dire need at this point of time is the structure on the bridge. So. I really hope that you'll support these motions tonight. Uh, uh, Councillor Hall and I do after many of uh, uh, consultation with uh, many community members and with staff. 
and uh, I, I, I don't think that staff is bringing you recommendations that they don't wish for us to proceed on. They've got a, a, wall, a limit to be able to negotiate with, and if so, then they can move forward with the, with the other in, in separate uh, RFPs. So um, I just hope that you'll support this tonight so that we can move forward with it. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to votes. So we're voting what's on the screen there, 11A, 1, 2, and 3. John again, it's a yes. Okay, all votes are in. Motion passes. All right, the next item is 11C, contract T20-104, supply and application of dust suppressants. Councillor Latimer followed by Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Through the mayor, um, I just I would like to support or make a motion to support this recommendation. But I had a comment. Did you want me to make that now, or do you want a seconder? Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Thompson. Uh, will you second this motion? Yeah, happy to second that. Okay, Councillor Latimer, your comment. Sure. I I actually uh, reached out to Ryan Brown, and uh, through him, Jerry Corso. Uh, responded to uh, my question about how to compare the difference of costs between the application of brine and alternative calcium chloride solutions uh, on a certain distance of road. And uh, Mr. Corso gave me a great explanation of the how-to, but I really didn't get a, an answer with uh, to how to improve the user friendliness of the charts that they gave us. So um, Ryan uh, agreed that uh, even looking at the application of dust suppressants charts that was part of this um, tender, that if, if they had even added a line, an extra line box to indicate how many kilometers of loose top roads respected to the estimated quantities of, um, of dust suppressant required, that would have enabled an easier comparison between um, the amounts of dust suppressant uh, required for the amount of roadway according across the divisions. So I will, uh, uh, I, that's all I wanted to comment on. And uh, Mr. Brown uh, agreed that that, you know, in, in looking and looking at that, he said, yeah, you're right. That would be an improvement for people who were not, didn't have all the information in their backpacks, like most counselors and, or, the general public to recognize what the difference in costs is between the, the divisions. Most of the difference in costs is, of course, the transportation, uh, not so much the, the, the brine or the alternative uh, solution. So I'll leave it at that. So I, I just uh, wanted to make a comment again about the user friendliness of the information presented uh, to the councillors in these uh, in the tenders and reports provided to us. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Actually, to be honest, Mr. Mayor, I'm good. Uh, we can go ahead and vote. Okay, seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Has everyone voted? Councillor Wright, were you able to vote? It's a yes, thank you, Judy. Thank you, all votes are in. Motion passes. Uh, the next report is 12B, Long Grass and Weeds Bylaw. Okay, Councillor Thompson. I would be happy to move. Councillor Harrigan. I'll second the recommendation and I have a question. Okay. Councillor Thompson, do you have any questions? Uh, no, not at this point. Okay. Councillor Harrigan. 
Thank you. Um, I don't have any issue with the bylaw that it is being presented, but I do have a question through the mayor to uh, Ryan Brown around how this applies or does not apply when there are individuals who are looking at uh, tall grass prairie projects or pollinator enhancement projects um, and how we make sure that we're not trying to eliminate um, some of those projects within the community that benefit the environment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ryan Brown, Director of Public Works. Um, this law is kind of twofold. Part of it is um, naming weed inspectors, uh, which is a requirement of the Weed Control Act, um, which is a provincial um, jurisdiction. So they, they say these weeds are noxious and you shall remove them if you're on your property. So we don't really have control over that. Um, however, uh, to answer your question right now, no, there is no um, exemption process in this bylaw uh, regarding um, a pollinator project or a, a prairie grass um, project. Uh, but what I can say is, is uh, I know these are kind of up and coming and a lot of other bounties are looking at them, but we to date in public works have not uh, been contacted by anyone um, who's uh, doing this project or even someone who who has this kind of a project and has drawn a complaint from a, a neighbor or a resident. So um, it's something we haven't thoroughly investigated uh, yet because I know this is kind of an upcoming issue um, and opportunity. Um, but once again, this this bylaw 99% of the time is, is a complaint driven process regarding uh, derelict properties that, that uh, have extremely long grass. Thank you. So I imagine, question. yes, it does. And then I imagine if somebody who is approached by a uh, weed enforcement individual, then they may be able to then escalate if there's individual circumstances that need to be considered. Yes. And, assuming and assuming to, they're in a tall prairie grass project. Correct. I, th I think communication is the first step. And I know there's a lot of information at uh, conferences and uh, webinars nowadays that are coming up on these things. So maybe there's some good tips from other municipalities. Um, and then also um, there is an appeal process through the uh, We Control Act if, if there was a disagreement. Thank you, those are my questions. Councillor C. McGregor. Thank you and through the mayor, I just wanted to uh, to thank uh, Ryan and department for bringing this forward. I knew this uh, and what I thought was going to be part of the property standards bylaw changes and such. But uh, I know that uh, in Wallaceburg here, I've dealt with a few properties with the with long grass and it's a repetitive problem. So um, um, I'm glad to see the uh, bylaw re repeal and replaced with uh, 39. What, I won't even try and read it. So, um, but I appreciate that this has come forward to be able to do this. And, and I hope that everybody uh, agrees uh, for information or for complaints they have within their own communities and that uh, we can move forward and uh, uh, eliminate some of these issues. Councillor Tom, uh, Thompson, any final thoughts or comments? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I, I found the question I was looking for. I was caught a little flat footed. Uh, a couple of uh, homeowners, and this is tangential, but a couple of homeowners in a, more of our um, lakeside resort communities were concerned this year due to the, uh, the ongoing COVID issues and whatnot. They were worried that um, as normal bylaws can be weaponized against each other. They were, so they were hoping for a little bit of leniency in regards to uh, maybe not having their grass quite as manicured as it normally is. Do we have any assurances that this won't be used as, as a weapon between homeowners that are fighting as we look at uh, the issues surrounding the pandemic and social distancing? They're concerned they won't be able to get to their their properties quite as often as they'd like to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, I can assure you that that public works is definitely um, not out actively looking to to enforce this bylaw. 
um, and, and understand homeowners uh, are potentially struggling due to the COVID uh, restrictions. So I think there there uh, needs to be more communication this year around that. And um, you know the the bylaw does have uh, notice periods in that. And um, you know as as it was mentioned, a lot of these these orders that are issued are are um, on the same properties year after year and and multiple times within a year. So we're we're willing to communicate with property owners if if this is kind of becoming an issue. Thank you, Councillor Foss. Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Foss. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a question: Is this a complaint driven by law, or is it something that uh, Board of Work actively uh, pursues? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, the bylaw is not actively; it, it's a complaint driven um, process. However, um, part of the changes to this bylaw are. Uh, the naming of all the weed inspectors and bylaw inspectors are uh, the road supervisors and other members of public works. And the reason for this is that at times um, a public overgrown parcel may be affecting sight lines or something of that nature to, that are kind of infringing on the safety of a roadway. So uh, that that would be the only time that that uh, my staff are actively pursuing um, enforcing a bylaw. Uh, most often we get a call from a concerned neighbor. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Good it's John, it's a yes. Has everybody voted and submitted? Okay. All votes are in. Motion passes. Uh, the next report is motion of Councillor McGrail, uh, re Dresden Kinsman Community Splash Pad. Councillor McGrail? Yes, um, I would like to move this and then speak on this. Okay, uh, Councillor Foss. I'd like to second it. Okay, back to you, Councillor McGrail. Thank you, just for the opportunity, Mayor Kenneth, just to say how wonderful this uh, this Dresden Kinsman Community Splash Pad Committee have been. In less than a year, they've raised you know the amount needed for the splash pad, and hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, um, in the near future, um, they'll be able to um, to build it. So I just want to give um, kudos to that group and their diligence and that um, working together again as a community group, which we all severely depend on, you know, they get it done. So um, like I said, I just want to give them some appreciation and some kudos. Councillor Wright, followed by Councillor Bondi. Thank you, Mayor Canop. Uh, three years ago, Ridgetown Qantas put a splash pad in, and Chatham Ken fix up all the expenses for that. Thank you. Councillor Bondi. Uh, thank you, Mayor Canop. Kingston Park in Chatham has a very large water park. Uh, what's What's going on there? Who paid for those bills? I don't know. Hello, it's uh, Thomas Kelly from the IES group. Uh, that's paid by the municipality. Uh, thank you, Thomas, through Mayor Kenneth. Well, then that only seems fair that uh, every one of these splash pads, which are effectively really uh, parks uh, should be supported by the municipality. Um, I have toured the Kingston Park facility and it's incredible. Uh, the water facilities, the, the cleaning of the water there is really, really incredible. And, and really, if council ever has the opportunity to see what happens underground as far as the uh, 
clean of the water, it's, it's pretty impressive. So I think uh, we should support every municipality, or sorry, <laughs> every small community within our municipality with these water parks because they're great things and they, they're very well used as far as I see, which my only experience is really in Mitchell's Bay and in Chatham, of course. Uh, they're great places and to incur the, the cost for this, I think, I think is something that we should look very proudly upon. So thank you. I, I, I will obviously will. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Judy, it's John, it's a yes. All votes are in. Motion passes. Okay, uh, that finishes off the reports, and now we'll move on to notices of motion. Okay. You're right. I apologize. Sorry, Steve. Uh, tax policy 2020, item 13A. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much. Uh, I would I would move them. I, the only comment I wanted to make, um, and it's going to come up, I believe, May fourth, a fair bit. There was an interesting Councilor little Thompson, note. If I can get it. Sorry, if I can get a seconder, and then we'll talk about it. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Councillor Finn, happy to second. Okay, back to you, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, my apologies. Jump the gun just a little bit there. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to draw really the community's attention to the one little line in there. Uh, waiving the taxes on Erie Shore Drive, which uh, I believe was the right thing to do, um, given the uh, the hardship that the community has faced there. That cost every homeowner, well, the average homeowner, $3.26. Now, coming up at the, uh, the next meeting in May, we're going to have um, probably a very lengthy conversation about costs, about money, and uh, about the, uh, the number of properties affected. And again, I just wanted to point out that, that doing nothing can often have um, an impact on uh, on our finances. Um, if we lose those communities on Erie Shore Drive, instead of being a one-time, you know, kind of expense of three dollars and twenty-six cents, that'll be that'll be money that we have to make up for the budget each and every year, because we will lose all of those homes and to be honest, a fair number of those uh, residents as well, all up and down, not only the uh, Lake Erie shoreline, but the, you know, the Lake St. Clair shoreline as well. Those are my comments. Thank you very much. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Judy, it's John again, yes. <laughs> All votes are in. Motion passes. Okay, now we will move on to notices of motion. Um, I did receive one from Councillor Latimer. Councillor Latimer, are you able to read it or would you like me to? Um, I, Councillor Mary Claire Latimer, hereby provide notice that I will bring forward the following motion at the May 11th, uh, 2020 Council meeting for discussion and voting that staff review and make recommendations to optimize current processes whereby councillors and or members of the public can monitor and or be notified of all upcoming planning, engineering drainage, development, and or any other anticipated projects in their respective wards. And that this recommended process be brought back to the June 15th meeting. Is there any others? That... Okay, hearing none. Oh, Councillor Sakachi. Sorry, through your worship, I apologize. That was just a, a slip. No comments, I'm good. Okay, hearing, hearing uh, no others, uh, we'll move to a closed session report, which there isn't any because we need to finish it up after our meeting. Uh, appro approval of communication items. We have one item uh, pulled out by Councillor Latimer, item 2A. Is there a, 
if uh, is there any other items that need to be pulled out to discuss separately? Hearing none. Is there anyone opposed? Is there anyone opposed to those items? Hearing none, that passes. Uh, Councillor Latimer, item two A. Yes, thank you, Mayor Caniff. Um, in response to the Ontario Senior of the Year Award nominations being um, opened, I would like to make the motion that the recipients of the 2019 Chad and Kent Senior of the Year Award, Cleta Morris and Robert Bob Hamilton be nominated for the 2019 Ontario Senior of the Year Award and that the clerk's office file the nomination forms for both recipients prior to the deadline of April 30th, 2020. Can I get a seconder for that motion? Councillor Crew. I'll second that. Any any questions related to that? Seeing none, we'll put it to vote. Oh, sorry. And rather than voting, will any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Non agenda business. Councillor Foss. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I just want to mention that uh, the um, Ontario Ministry uh, that um, we received a memorandum from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. David Williams, who acknowledges the extraordinary and continuing efforts by Board of Health to monitor, direct, and contain COVID-19 in, in the province. He also iterated that the Boards of Health are expected to take all necessary measures to respond to COVID-19 in their catchment areas while continuing, continuing to maintain critical public health programs and services as identified in their pandemic plans. He also acknowledged the impact of COVID-19 will anticipate that boards of health are incurring additional expenses. In support of these efforts, the government has announced on May, March 25th, that they are investing up to $100 million in additional funding for public health to, ex to support the extraordinary costs incurred. Similar to previous processes, that these costs be those that are over what, are man what can be managed to within the budget of the Board of Health and that they track these costs separately. This is great news and the Board of Health in Chatham Kent is tracking COVID-19 costs and will apply for whatever they are entitled to. Also, this is uh, nice to see that the province has seen how important the public health is to Ontario. Thank you. Councillor Latimer. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have two items. First is for a question for Fire Chief Chris Case. I'm wondering if you can update us on the status of the current municipal wide burn ban uh, and I guess I'll let him answer that and then I'll ask my second question. Thank you, Councillor Latimer. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So as Council will be aware, on the 1st of April, we implemented a 28-day ban of residential campfires. And that involves around 80 people who have permits for residential campfires. We gave the reasons behind the ban, which was to reduce the burden on fire crews and reduce any unnecessary exposures. And we also said that we were waiting for the provincial and federal governments to see if there'd be any changes to community safety controls. And at this time, there has not been. So at this time, we are proposing to continue the ban until we see the situation changes. But I would, uh, I would have to recognize our first responders, the police, the EMS and our fire crews who've all adapted to new ways of working and they continue to attend calls. They continue to respond to calls, both our full-time and our volunteer firefighters. And whilst I recognize this action is quite frustrating for those people who like to have a campfire, it's not hearing being... the chief case very well, everybody. Are you? Actually, yes, Councillor Bondi, we can hear him just fine. It may be your connection. I'm not sure. 
my apologies. Can can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Chief Case. Thank you. I say that the action will be frustrating for those that enjoy a campfire, especially when they're confined to their homes. Uh, but people do see smoke and flames and they naturally call 911 and a fire crew is sent out and they have to interact with that person. And that can lead to a that can lead to a dispute where the police are called and everything else. And I, and I we've discussed this with a lot of people. We we talked to Dr. Colby, we've talked to our operational staff, we've talked to council. And today I had a conversation with Chief Con, who advised me that over the past three weeks, there's been over a thousand calls for service for police and bylaw enforcement officers to deal with the emergency measures that have been brought about due to COVID-19. So I'd ask people to support the ban, work together and help us beat the pandemic so that we can protect our responders, protect our community, and hopefully when the situation changes, we can review this. And I hope that's very, very soon. I hope that answers your question, Councillor Latimer. Yes, thank you, Chief Case. I do have one more, uh, just uh, maybe on behalf of the municipality, whether or not the current uh, recreational burn permits are being extended for the length of the time burn, the burn ban is in effect. Yes, we've confirmed that with the uh, with our finance team at the moment, they're being extended to cover the period of the ban. Thank you very much. And uh, the last thing I wanted to ask, um, I was speaking or sent a message to our mayor, uh, viewing the recent increased stress and workload due to COVID-19 currently being experienced by our own municipal administration staff to ensure maintenance of essential services and the continued safety of both our residents and employees I can only imagine a level of increased stress, heartbreak and devastation that the rural municipality of Colchester Township, Nova Scotia Council and administration are living out right now. So for that reason, I would like to make the motion that the municipality of Chatham Kent send a note of condolence and support to the mayor and council of Colchester Township in Nova Scotia, acknowledging their ongoing efforts to support and stand in solidarity with their communities now grieving in such sorrow under continued pandemic restrictions. Yes, uh, Councillor Latimer, uh, we've already sent a letter. What I can do is uh, we can have it sent to Council and then we'll have it included in our next Council package. Thank you very much. I think it's important that we, uh, we acknowledge and support uh, other rural communities uh, in Canada, especially dealing with such uh, violence and devastation. Thank you. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Oche, followed by Councillor Hall, and then Councillor Pinsano. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd just like to bring up the uh, uh, May 16th miracle, um, which is going to be happening all across Chatham Kent, and they're asking everyone to put out uh, um, some groceries or their food on their porch so that uh, uh, they can be picked up and brought to the local food bank. So if it's uh, put out in Chatham, I'll go to a Chatham food bank. If it's put out in Wheatley, I'll go to a Wheatley food bank. Uh, um, and it's happening, that's a Saturday at noon. So uh, if people want to look up the uh, the website uh, and volunteer, they can do that as well. Sorry, I don't have it right off the top of my head at the moment, but uh, um, that would be, it's going to be a great thing for, uh, for Chatham Kent. So I hope everybody and all the councillors and staff can get in behind this. Thank you. Councillor Hall. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Uh, I have a few questions also related to COVID-19. Um, I heard from a local resident who had some questions and concerns as parents and guardians who continue to navigate through this pandemic. Um, the resident pointed out <clears throat> excuse me, that they're not teachers and they're becoming very frustrated trying to work from home and raise kids at the same time. Um, so my first question to Dr. Rietdijk, um, if we cannot open up summer programs, um, et cetera, can we provide them virtually, things like crafts and healthy eating, songs and games? So through you, Mary Caniff, uh, Councillor Hall, thank you for the question. So as we kind of navigate and look at plans, uh, as we get closer and closer to uh, summer, uh, our teams are really spending uh, some time looking at 
what are we able to offer virtually? Um, what are some of the other kind of service groups and school boards offering virtually uh, as well with some ideas for, for parents who continue to be stuck at home um, and as you indicated, juggling kind of parenting things and school things and, and children things. Our early on team uh, that runs our early on centers throughout the community, they are uh, working on a number of videos they are juggling this with uh, being redeployed assisting at Riverview Gardens. Uh, so they are balancing both of those tasks. And uh, I will certainly ask that team to get some messaging out uh, to parents uh, with some ideas and uh, some other opportunities for them to uh, do with their children. So. I think uh, you know we will have to follow the province's lead uh, as to uh, opening back up any of our recreation programs and services. Uh, we'll take the lead of Dr. Colby as well. Uh, but certainly as we get closer to the warmer months, um, I will take that back to my team and uh, have them take a closer look at that. Right on. Thank you, uh, April. And and maybe a, a very similar question, but instead focusing on older adults or seniors in the community, um, is it possible? Have we looked at things like chair exercise or stretching or cards done virtually? Uh, through you, Mary Ken, if that's a great question as well. I think that what uh, I will do with that is probably have uh, Teresa and uh, some uh, working with the age friendly committee and see if we can get that back to our uh, senior centers and see if they would be willing to look at uh, some opportunities of getting some information out virtually to our older adults in the community. I think I think I'd like to engage them in this and and see what some of their thoughts uh, and opportunities are. Uh, and then if we still have a gap, we can take a look at how we might uh, be able to fill that gap. Excellent. And just one more question uh, from the resident as well. Um, has the, uh, have we looked at offering virtual tours to the community? Um, and this was their idea. You know, some examples would be of our fire department, of the, uh, you know, the public, the big trucks at the, at the public works yard, or even the, uh, the water treatment plan. Is this something that... Uh, you know, the, the resident really thought this would be a great showcase for the community or a good opportunity uh, during this time. So is that something that could be looked at as well? Um, I certainly can take that back and we can look at it. Uh, I think that that's a really cool idea that I, I must admit had never turned uh, my mind to, but um, certainly people on this call know I have a passion for fire trucks and so even a virtual tour of a fire truck would would be really cool so um, I'll take that back and have a conversation with uh, my team excellent thank you April and thanks to the resident for the for the ideas so thank you mayor Canna. mr. mayor it's uh, it's chief case if I may uh, I can announce that um, Whitney Burke is planning a Facebook live from station one in the next couple of weeks which is something I know you'll all be very excited to tune into. Uh, Councillor Pinsano, followed by Councillor uh, Finn. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd just like to mention that a longtime fire chief in Thamesville, Roy Holmes, passed away yesterday. He uh, was serving chief for 25 years, very involved with the community, uh, baseball program, uh, his church. Um, Anyway, I just like to send condolences out to the family. Councillor Finn, followed by Councillor McGregor. Uh, Chief Case had already uh, talked about the fire bans. Could you also explain if the agricultural burns are included in that as well? Thank you, Councillor Finn. Through you, Mr. May. Uh, we we haven't impacted agricultural burns. Uh, what happens for an agricultural burn is that the the farmer works with the local station chief and comes up with a very encompassing plan to deal with that burn. So uh, the current burn ban doesn't affect the agricultural community uh, at all. But thank you for your question. 
Councillor C. McGregor. Uh, thank you, and through the mayor. Uh, sorry, just uh, some of the things that Councillor Hall last year just kind of got my mind tweaked there. So um, I just wanted to ask through you to Dr. Reed. I, um, do you have any, do you have a report coming back to us on uh, at all, maybe with scenarios that what might happen? I know today we heard about uh, a process to reopen the province. I don't know if there was a lot of information about how we reopen the province, but you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot could happen between now and say July and July and August is when we normally do summer programs in our camps. So um, I'm just wondering if you have a report coming to us at all, or if uh, through your discussions and stuff, along with the, some of the virtual stuff, if you're planning for, for different scenarios um, and if we could get some examples of that. And if you're just sharing with Council Hall, maybe you could share with me also. And like, I know, you know, I hear the frustration. I have, I have kids with children at home and different things. And I know that it's scary for them, the thoughts of even schools opening up right now and putting, you know, 30 kids back in a classroom and different things. There's gonna be a lot of different things that come through the community that, uh, you know, we're all going to be maybe a little leery about jumping back in regardless what the province tells us. So um, just uh, just a thought there, I was just thinking like, do we have, can we get some examples of scenarios or something that we could share with parents or, um, and maybe this is something you already have planned for a report coming in the future. So just thought I'd ask. Through you, Mayor Kenneth, uh, to council, certainly, um, I will answer part of this and I'll turn it over to uh, some of my other EMT colleagues as well. So certainly we, within my portfolio, within public health, um, we have no real crystal ball in terms of trying to really look at, at uh, when the Premier will begin to open things back up in Ontario. Uh, certainly I concur the the roadmap that was released today while it does outline very specifically what has to happen in the province before they will even begin to look at uh, starting to relax some of the public health measures that have been put in place. Uh, just getting to a point of you know, that three to six weeks of continuous uh, cases dropping um, is is going to take some time to, to even get that far. So certainly uh, we are thinking, we've got our teams thinking and looking ahead as to what does this look like? What does this mean for um, libraries if, if the province uh, maintains uh, libraries being closed? What does this look like for all of our um, sports fields and, and those types of things? Uh, so I think, I think uh, it's on our minds for sure. It's on all of our uh, thoughts and it's certainly on all of our staff's uh, minds as they try and navigate different ways of getting information out uh, to residents. Uh, both young and old, uh, parents navigating with children um, and also navigating with older adults um, at home. So I don't, I, I think I'll stop there and see if there's any other EMT members that uh, want to chime in as well. Can I, if nobody else is gonna jump in, can I just follow up on something? Yes, go ahead. Um, well, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, there are some of those school programs out there because I know I hear about my kids doing their, their homework and stuff. And uh, so I'm just wondering, like, is this something like, especially that, you know, that four to 12 year right now, they are all online and they are doing, you know, work and programs for school. Is this something our rec department can uh, yeah, maybe dovetail on. Um, I don't know if the schools would let us do that, but uh, I'd hate to recreate the wheel and trying to do a totally uh, um, separate program. But, you know, is this something, you know, I can, as soon as uh, Councillor Hall said, you know, like crafts and, and different things, I think of all those lovely days I had as a child in, in Summer Park. I still remember those days and taking my own kids there. 
And, you know, now they're like, right now, kids are not getting, you know, they're, they are doing a lot of stuff online, but they're not getting exercise and not doing different stuff right now. So just wondering, is that something that we or our rec department can kind of dovetail on some of those other programs that, that can help kids be active and, and, uh, and maybe in a different way than just, you know, getting on the computer to do their schoolwork and everything else they're doing on the computer. Uh, through you, Mayor Caniff, um, I agree, uh, Council McGregor. I think what I would ask, uh, certainly our early on group dealing with our really young kids, uh, they do not have the benefit of all of the work that the schools are uh, doing right now with our uh, elementary school and then certainly high school kids are doing their online uh, programs as well. What I would ask uh, my team, and um, we've got a number of our rec uh, staff that have been redeployed with all of uh, programs uh, being put on hold, but certainly what I think I would ask them first is to do a bit of investigating uh, and maybe provide uh, some updated information and some links to all the programs that are already out there. There are a number of people doing, uh, you know, online fitness programs for kids and dance programs for kids and, and all kinds of, of things that are already available. And uh, I agree, I don't, I don't think we want our staff um, recreating things that are already out there for that age group. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, oh, she sorry. has... Uh, sorry, sorry. That, that's wonderful, April. I, I greatly appreciate that. So hopefully we have enough other employees. I know you've had to redeploy a lot of uh, staff and different stuff. So have it, if it comes to, to that point, hopefully they can be they can be pulled back or somehow be able to, to work on some of this. So thank you so very much for, for I know it's kind of last minute and, and uh, thank you for uh, answering. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Two quick procedural things. First one is council, before we uh, just finish up here, uh, you have been sent a second um, Skype invite now for closed session that we'll go back into quickly uh, right after we finish here. So please uh, log in that way. And in addition, just for the reading of the bylaws, please note that number four and five have been removed as that application has been postponed until the future uh, planning meeting. Thank you. Okay, this is when I test everybody how fast they get the unmute button. Uh, first and second reading, can I get a motion? Councillor Solman. Yes, you can. <laughs> uh, Councillor B. McGregor. Seconded. Uh, anyone opposed? Carried. Third and final reading, Councillor Wright. There, I make a motion to move on it. Uh, Councillor Harrigan. Seconded. Uh, any opposed? Carried. Uh, Councillor C. McGregor, resolution of council in closed session and, and adjournment. Thank you. And through the mayor, I would move that Chatham Kent Council adjourn to its next meeting to be held on Monday, May 4th, 2020, and that the Chatham Kent Council authorize itself to meet in closed session on that day to discuss any matters permitted by the Municipal Act. Seconded by Councillor Foss. Yes, I'll second that. Anyone opposed? Carried. All right, let's go back to closed session. Thanks, everyone.